This is so insightful that I had to share it with you. If you've been on the fence regarding Bitcoin or cryptocurrency as a whole, in this video, all of that will be clear. And I can tell you that after watching this video, you will have a clear understanding and you will actually realize why it's so important for you to own Bitcoin. Okay. And so Peter H conducted an interview with Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy and Bill Babrak, who is the founder and CEO of Abra. So he was basically explaining the entire, you know, he really broke it down to really simple terms. Okay really simple and understandable terms as far as why you need Bitcoin, why is it important and, you know, cryptocurrency as a whole. OK, so my name is Vincent Mbata and on this channel we discuss crypto education and ways to stay profitable. We find different ways to earn passive income with cryptocurrency. So if you are new to this channel, make sure you hit that uh, subscribe button and you also want to hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that i put out and also do go ahead and give this video a like and spread it uh to as you know share it with as many people as possible because it's so important moving forward that people know the importance of cryptocurrency and really you know if you are trying to make extra income or to end passive income this is it okay and we have the greatest opportunity now through through cryptocurrency uh you know the the biggest wealth transfer in history is happening right now so i mean you just have to take action okay so i'm gonna play this video uh this interview and uh you know give it a listen give it a watch and i will see you guys in the next one take care let me do a proper introduction here um First and foremost, uh, Michael, welcome. Good morning. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Peter. Yeah, of course, pal. Let me uh, introduce Michael. Michael Saylor is the chairman and CEO of MicroStrategies, a publicly traded business intelligence firm that he founded in 1989. Um, uh, he is also founder of Alarm.com, named inventor in 40 patents, uh, author of the book Mobile Wave, Founded and served as a trustee of Sailor Academy, Sailor.org, a nonprofit organization that provides free education to 800,000 students, inventors, uh, inventor on, as I said, over 40 patents. Uh, he is an advocate of Bitcoin, um, a strong advocate, and we'll get into that in a moment. What I'm most shocked about is how, how recently uh, Michael came to this realization and how powerfully he is engaged in this conversation. Um, hope.com is his site uh, that you should all go take a look at in terms of resource to understand this properly. Uh, dual degrees in MIT from aerospace engineering uh, and history of science. And full disclosure, my fraternity brother, effectively a roommate, we, uh, we lived together for uh, many years and very proud of that um, uh, at Theta Delta Chi. Michael, uh, good to have you, pal. Yeah, thanks for having me, Peter. Yeah. Let me introduce Bill Barnheit as well. Um, uh, Bill is CEO and founder of Abra, uh, the leading crypto wealth management app, about just about a billion dollars uh, in, uh, in assets under management. Abra, uh, first service combining crypto brokerage, a high yield interest account, a lending service for borrowing against crypto holdings, which is a really, for me, critically uh, critical innovation. Bill's uh, multi-decade career in the internet spans everything from being at Goldman Sachs, at NASA, at Netscape. And he, importantly, I think, gave the first TED Talk on Bitcoin back in 2012. Uh, has been a freaking, frequent uh, uh, expert on many of the top media. So guys, uh, here's my, my mission for us today. And uh, we're going to be focusing, Michael, on you. But these are the topics I really want to hit hard for our, our members, um, what is Bitcoin? And more than an asset class, uh, why is it important for creating a world of abundance? Because I really do believe it's fundamental for that. And, and Michael, I, I credit you with really, uh, you know, clicking that for me. Why is Bitcoin important on, on a corporate balance sheet? The implications of El Salvador's historic move? Uh, what countries are next? Why do you think it's important for individuals to consider holding Bitcoin? 
as a store of value. You know, Michael, you recently did a very interesting uh, uh, series of conversations about comparing it to gold. We're going to regulation, we're going to DeFi, a little bit of Ethereum and altcoins. So those are our subjects for the day. Um, Michael, I, I was amazed <coughs> that you came to a realization about the importance of Bitcoin. It wasn't five or eight years ago. Uh, it was really at the, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, can you tell that story? Uh, and and let's, let's let you go here, man. Tell us about why sure. it's so important. Um. Okay, so the, the catalyst for me to discover Bitcoin was the K-shaped recovery, the, the, the combination of the lockdowns and the expansion of the money supply. And I think, I think what we saw was in the K-shaped recovery, Main Street shut down for a year, mm -hmm. Wall Street recovered in a few weeks, and there was a delamination between financial assets and mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, Main Street type assets or operational assets. And that caused me to question the nature of money because if, if I had a um, billion dollars worth of Wall Street assets like the S&P index, I could have gone to sleep on my floaty in my Hampton swimming pool for a year and I would have had the best year of my career doing nothing. And if I actually ran a Main Street company selling something or doing something, I could have worked 30% harder and generated 30% more cash flow and I would have got nothing. And this, this dichotomy between one class of, of uh, the economy working 30% harder to get nowhere and the other class of the economy not working at all to get 30% further caused me to lose uh, a lot of faith uh, in the economy and, and, and it questioned my thought about money. And so if we go to first principles, Peter, I think the most important idea is Money is financial energy or it's socioeconomic energy. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize or don't think about it as an energy system. Yep. And as soon as you think about it as energy, then the light bulb goes off. And Peter, you're an engineer, or I'm an engineer. And I spent many years after I left MIT not really thinking about engineering principles applying to money or finance. And I think that in March of 2020, it shocked me out of that uh, lethargy. So I'll give you a simple analogy. Uh, fat is organic energy. It's an, it's an organic energy storage battery. You know, if you eat a bunch of food, you, uh, your body generates insulin, you store the organic energy as fat. The benefit of storing that fat <coughs> uh, is that you can go without food for a month and you won't die. Now, so fat is a uh, energy system for storing organic energy. There are other systems for storing organic energy. I can have box food. I can have Twinkies, I can have canned food, I can have smoked food, right? I can have fish in a pond behind my house. I can have cows outside in the pasture. Those are all systems for storing organic energy. We call it agriculture or we call it packaging. Now, now let's think about other energy systems. You know, I, I put a sail on a ship. That's a, that's a way to harness wind energy. A clipper ship with three sails is more complicated. A bow and arrow harnesses kinetic energy or potential energy. So does a dam. I can have a gun. I can have complicated machines. The entire science of engineering is about channeling energy, whether it's gravitational energy or wind energy or chemical energy like a fire or uh, organic energy. So now I get to money. So money is a system for channeling that social economic energy that the ability to compel other members of the human race to do something or to, you know, will you give me your house? Will you give me your car? Will you drive your car for me? Will you build a building for me? Can I live on it for life? Will you feed me for the rest of my life? Will you work for me the rest of my life? All of this is about channeling energy. The human race has had energy systems for money. We started with seashells. We trade the giant stone cone of the Yap people. Eventually we settled upon gold. <clears throat> And gold is uh, commodity tokens, but it wasn't just simple gold. You know, the Lydians had gold coins. The Romans had different gold coins. The, you know, the Italians had the Florins, you know, the British had the pound the sovereign comes along. So eventually we realized that, that, that moving around gold tokens or tokens in general, isn't that efficient because you can't chop them into pieces. And if you're holding them, people club you over the head and steal them. So Sometime early on, certainly 500 years ago, we split and we had 
the underlying base layer money may be gold. And then you had gold paper, like gold notes, and you had paper money. And the paper money uh, be, uh, issued by first goldsmiths and then issued by early, uh, early gold banks and the like, that allowed us to trade, trade credits. And that went on for 500 years. And, and the world shifted between this base layer commodity and paper money. Uh, we eventually had the quote unquote gold standard, which is you can trade a dollar for gold and trade the gold for the dollar. Then uh, with the Treaty of Genoa in 1922, we had a gold reserve standard, which meant that um, the dollar and the pound were the reserve currencies. They were backed by gold and everybody else was backed by the dollar and the pound. After World War II, we went to the Treaty of Bretton Woods and that meant that the US dollar was a reserve currency. It was backed by gold. And then everybody else traded their currencies for the dollar. Um, and uh, what's the significance? Uh, eventually in 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard uh, completely. And we went to all fiat, not pegged to any underlying asset. And what that meant was in the absence of any thermodynamic cost to print more money, you don't need to mine gold. You don't need to do anything. Uh, we could just and expand the money supply. And that, that resulted in about monetary inflation of 7% a year, every year for 40 years. That I didn't figure out, but what that means is if you're expanding the money supply by seven to 8% a year, every year, that means that your assets have to appreciate by 7% to keep purchase power parity. And that means if you're earning, if, if you're not raising your salary by 7%, you're getting poorer. Now that went on a status quo from 1971 all the way to 2020. In 2020, the monetary inflation rate in the US went from 7% to 21%, it tripled. And every other currency in the world's pegged to the dollar, they at least tripled. So the Euro tripled, uh, the DRAM tripled, the, all the strong currencies tripled their inflation rate. The weak currencies inflated 40% a year. Uh, and, uh, and so they're sinking against the dollar. Then you've got the, the peso with nominal 45% inflation rate, but real inflation rates of 70% or more. And then you have collapsing currencies like in El Salvador, the currency is collapsed. In Nigeria, it's collapsing. In Lebanon, it collapsed 80, 85%. In Zimbabwe, it collapsed. So what is the significance of Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first engineered monetary system in the history of the human race. Uh, and that's the light bulb going off. We created an asset sitting on an open computer network, and there's never going to be more than 21 million of them. You can divide it into 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis. So it's pretty infinitely divisible. But what it means is the human race has perfected the idea of a bearer instrument like gold, and we fixed all the defects of gold. Uh, if I bought a billion dollars of gold, the gold miners will keep dumping more gold on the market. The, uh, if the gold ever goes up by a factor of 10, gold jewelry gets melted down to dump gold on the market. And the fundamental problem with the gold standard and the gold reserve standard is there is no hard mathematical protocol or engineering protocol that links the paper gold or the, or the fiat derivatives to the underlying asset. So as soon as the U.S. got control of the gold supply after Bretton Woods, they could keep printing more and more money. And they weren't. And, and first it was 40 percent backed by gold and 30 percent and 20 percent and 10 percent. Then all the other countries in the world realized that the U.S. was just going to print infinite dollars and the French got upset. So they started asking for the gold back. And when the French asked for the gold back, all the gold was flowing out of the U.S. And then Nixon said, oh, my God, we're going to have no gold left. And so we can't keep giving people gold back. So we we defaulted on the gold standard and now everybody's free to print as much money as they wanted. And, and so that's, that's by the way, why you don't want to buy gold because if you buy gold uh, a gold banker can basically sell a hundred tons of gold for every one gold ton of gold they own. You call a repot hypothecation. There is no integrity between the paper, uh, the paper derivatives and the underlying asset. And the absence of that technical integrity means, and we come back to engineering, it means that, um, that I put energy into the system and it bleeds out 10% a year. 
So if I had a if I had a bathtub bleeding seven percent per period, right? The bathtub drains, the swimming pool drains. If I have a leak in a fuselage of an airplane, it won't fly. If I have a leak in a hull of a ship, it won't sail. So uh, Bitcoin's the first thermodynamically sound system. It's a closed. I love, I system. love that analogy. I love that analogy. And <clears throat> you know, one of the things that is clear is uh, the majority of the world does not appreciate the level of inflation that's incurring and they don't realize they're moving backwards um or maybe they realize it but a bit too late they think you know everybody's working hard one of the points you made uh in particular was uh that this this economic thermodynamically sound economic system is probably more important for the developing world than it is even for the developed world can you speak to that um, in the developed world, you have banks and you can move money from point to point for a few dollars and you have wall street and you can buy assets like the S and P 500 index. If you don't put, if you had a hundred thousand dollars, if you don't put it in the S and P index, you lost purchasing power every year, 7% of it for a decade. So the store of value in the Western world is I shift my assets into ETFs and index funds and stocks, and I, and I wire money around on Apple Pay or whatever it might be, write a check, it's cheap. In the developed world, two thirds of, of Mexicans don't have a bank. In El Salvador, they don't have banks. Billions and billions of people don't have banks. And we say they're unbanked. In India, they don't have a bank, but most people don't really think about what that means. Here's what it means. You're a type A, a type one diabetic, and you don't have insulin. And that means you can eat infinite food, you can't form fat, and you will starve to death. That's what that means. If you can't store economic energy over a long period of time, it means that you can work yourself to death. All your life savings gets drained to zero. And in the, in the month when you lose your job, your family starves to death. So unbanked. In El Salvador, it means there's 2 million people in the U.S. that send billions of $10 billion back to El Salvador every year. One billion of it gets stolen by the money transfer agents. Okay, they take a 10% commission. Crazy. Okay, you're taking 10% commissions from a, a wage laborer sending money to their mother, 10%. The, the, the Visa and MasterCard network, by the way, take 2.5%. They're monopolies. Okay, but two and a half percent is painful. Ten percent is is brutal. Then you have to get the money through uh, through a Western Union office, which means travel for two or three hours, and maybe you get mugged on the way. And when you get the money, you get the money in a currency. In in certain third world countries, you get the money in the local currency, which is losing thirty to forty percent of its value a year. So I send you a thousand dollars, you get nine hundred, then you spend another. 100 to get it so you get down to 800 and then every month that goes by you lose 50. so it's pretty devastating that what's the problem you can't move the monetary energy and the second problem is you can't store it i mean in the u.s the typical u.s or western uh western individual is losing one to two percent of their energy a month if they store it in the currency the way they get around it is they buy S&P index and the S&P is up 32% year over year and they pretend they're rich, right? It's like, good. How does someone in El Salvador buy S&P index stocks? They don't have Robin Hood. They don't have a bank, yep. right? So you're living hand to mouth. So the significance of Bitcoin for them is you can take a $50 Android phone, download a, a software wallet. I can send you $87 instantly for free on a lightning network. If you store it in Bitcoin, it's going to go up in value. And otherwise you can spend it. And, and you're not, uh, you're not uh, at the mercy of, of, I'd like to say banks, but the banks don't care. You're not at the mercy of the money changers. And the best case is El Salvador where they use the US dollar. So they're only losing one to 2% of their purchasing power a month. The worst case is Zimbabwe, which means that somebody runs the country, you have to buy the local currency, and that person that runs the country gives billions of dollars of that currency to their buddy, and, the, and you better spend the currency because it'll only be worth half as much in four weeks or eight weeks. And in the real worst case, 
they tell you it's illegal to hold any, any other asset. I can't hold land. I can't hold gold. I can't buy stocks. And so, you know what, it's literally like taking your insulin away and making all of you diabetics and saying it's illegal to store fat on your body. Good luck with that. And the one day when you can't find food, you will surely die. So I want to just, I wanted to double click on this because it's so important. I mean, the realization, and this was a conversation we had down in your home in Miami, just a couple of, I don't know, a month or two ago, is how absolutely critical this type of a engineered economic system is uh, to allow people to have prosperity, right? I mean, one of the things we talk about is exponential technologies are taking everything that used to be scarce into abundance, whether it's food, energy, water, healthcare, and so forth. But I love the system of the requirement to be able to store energy and, and money is economic energy. What happened in El Salvador? Um, can you take a moment to, to explain um, <clears throat> the, the implications and, and how important this is? Well, I think they had a civil war and they lost, they lost their currency. Okay, countries that are poorly managed lose their currency privileges. And what we can see is that the, at 100, company, 100 countries in the world are all losing their currencies. Everybody's basically, you know, the Venezuelans are not going to have a currency. The Zimbabwe don't have a currency. Any currency that collapses more than 20 to 30 percent against the U.S. dollar eventually fails. So people throw that over and they go to the dollar. The euro is effectively pegged to the dollar. You know, most of the other currencies are pegged to the dollar. So you've really got two currency systems. You've got CNY and even the Chinese peg their currency to the dollar. Right. If you look at it. So you've got, you've got the first world currency system, then you've got the developed world currencies, they're all failing. So in El Salvador, they, had, they didn't have a currency, they used the US dollar, and then they're at the mercy of two things. One, the money changers are basically stealing 10 to 20% of their money when they move it back and forth. If I charge you 10% commission every time you move your money to, your, to a family member, I mean, how many times do you get to do that, right? So that's a problem. And the second problem is, now I'm storing my money in the US dollar. It used to lose half a percent a month, and now it's losing 2% purchasing power a month because the Fed's printing money. So how do you crawl out of that abyss? And, and I think the president of El Salvador realized that, that um, what you want to do is back your currency or, or back your country with an asset which is appreciating in value. So Bitcoin's been appreciating 120% a year every year for a decade. Uh, the S&P is up 12% a year for a decade. So Bitcoin outperforms the S&P by a factor of 10. It outperforms gold, which is up by maybe, maybe 1% to 2% 2, 2 a decade. So it's outperforming gold by a factor of 50. What's the, what's, look, here's the big idea. But Bitcoin's not just an asset, right? It's, it's the perfected apex property of the human race. If you have a billion dollars and you want to give it to your grandchildren, are you going to buy land in California, a building in New York, a billion dollar stack of gold? Are you going to buy a billion dollars of Apple stock? Are you going to buy a billion dollars worth of art, diamonds, commodities, corn futures, oil? What are you going to buy for a billion dollars that'll be here 100 years from now? And, and if you think about it really hard, you conclude that every other asset class is more easily impaired, seized, confiscated, taxed, or, uh, or regulated. And, and of course, some are impractical. There's no way that 5 billion people in Africa and Asia are going to be walking around with Apple stock on their mobile phones. That's not happening. How, you know, how do you, how do you pay for, your, you know, for anything with Apple stock on a Saturday afternoon in South Africa? Right? That doesn't work. And so, yeah, you, you could try to use a currency. But now I've been in business 20 years. I can't do business in Nigeria after 20 years because... If you want to do business in the fiat currency, you have to have your bank deal with your central bank, deal with their central bank, deal with their bank. Can't do it on the weekend and you can't do it because of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in Russia or Nigeria or whoever. And so how do you get 8 billion people trading with each other through 100 million corporations? You need a protocol. What is the protocol? Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin so, so is Michael, an open monetary protocol to link 8 billion people and 100 million companies with one another in the 21st century. I'm going to get back to El Salvador. Give me a Bitcoin 101, if you don't mind. We probably have some people here who um, 
have heard of it and are interested in learning about it. And I'm, we've had a wide range. And I want to get back to what did the president of El Salvador just do? But let's take a second and, and give us the, the, the Bitcoin 101, if you would. Okay. Let's say that I, wa I wanted to store, uh, create a non-sovereign store of value. I have a million dollars. I want to save it for 100 years. And I don't want to trust anybody else with the money. I can't put it in a bank. I had a, I ha every single person in Argentina had 90% of their US dollars and their Argentine pesos seized overnight by the government 20 years ago by edict, mm. stroke of a pen. It wasn't hard. So I can't leave it in a bank. I, ca I can't store it in a currency because the banks can steal it from me. I can't save it in a stock. This, the company might not even exist and the CEO or the board might dilute it. I can't put it in land uh, because I can't move the land and they could tax in Florida, they tax you 2% a year on the land. You lose your land in 20 years. So I buy gold. Now that's, that's the traditional idea, but the problem with gold is that every year gold miners produce 2% more gold. And then I have to, I can't carry a billion dollars of gold through an airport. So I have to put it in a bank and then 95 of, of the top hundred cities in the world, 95 or more of them seized all your gold in the past hundred years when the regime changes. Okay, so how do I fix that? So this guy Satoshi invented digital gold on an open protocol monetary network. Uh, and we call that Bitcoin. And the way it works is I define 21 million gold coins. I dematerialize them in cyberspace. I make them infinitely divisible by a hundred million units each. And that's called a Satoshi. Then I um, make it impossible to ever make any more than 21 million. And then I give you a protocol where any, any co computer can send the coin or, or the, the Bitcoin to any other computer without a middleman. And I make it possible for you to take personal custody of your asset. So if I want a billion dollars worth of property, I can carry it around in my head by memorizing the passphrase. I can hold it on a hardware wallet. I can, I can hold it on a mobile phone. I can put it to any computer in the world. Then I can move the billion dollars to any custodian in the world in a few minutes for a pittance. So the idea is if I took gold and I said, you can't mine any more gold, check, that would make gold more valuable. And if I said, uh, you can't use it for jewelry, there's no jewelry being melted down into gold, that makes gold more valuable. And if I capped it at 21 million and I numbered each of the gold coins, that'd make it more valuable. And if I made it infinitely divisible, and if you could authenticate it in a split second with a mobile phone, that would make it more valuable. And if I made it programmable with a protocol and I made it possible for a computer to make a million transactions a second and talk to a hundred million other computers using, Intel semiconductors, that would make it more valuable. So in essence, we created programmable gold on a network. And then what's the last twist? The last twist is you make it decentralized so that there's 10,000 different computers or maybe even 100,000 different computers running the software at the same time with an identical copy of the ledger so that no company, no CEO, no government, no regulator can meddle with it, the protocol. So it is literally, uh, it, it's like uh, a virus released into cyberspace, a living life form. You can't stop it without turning off every computer on earth at the same time. And you have to keep them turned off forever, right? You can't kill it. And so the idea of Bitcoin is, is apex property for the human race. And for the first time in the history of the human race, if you have a million dollars, you can hold a million dollars in your head, walk through a border, send it across the world, take custody or transfer it to any custodian or prove that you have it in a split second. And uh, you can't do that with anything else. That's, that's, what, that's what Bitcoin is. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, so, so let's go back to what El Salvador just did and the implications thereof. Um, yeah. Please. Okay, well... Um, if the U.S. dollar is losing 20% of its purchasing power a year, which is what's happening right now, the dollar is collapsing against scarce assets. The reason the NASDAQ or the stock exchange is an all-time high isn't because the companies are more valuable, it's because your currency is weak. 
and the currency keeps collapsing uh, against uh, scarce assets. That's why we have inflation. That's why houses in the Hamptons or Palm Beach cost more. That's why the average home in the U.S. costs 15% more than it did 12 months ago. So <clears throat> if El Salvador is going to prosper as a country, they need to invest their assets or invest their money in something which isn't going to collapse. If you're holding a billion dollars of U.S. dollars and if the U.S. Fed doubles the dollar supply, they stole half your money from you. That's what's going on right now. So what El Salvador- Why is that is, not obvious to everybody? It's, it's crazy. It's because part of the world is rich and privileged. And so if you, if you are wealthy in the U, in US and Europe and you have a large stock portfolio, you think you're a genius because your portfolio is up 32% or 47% year over year and you made wise investment decisions, right? And then you think, oh, yeah, I, I see that everything's going up in price, but, you know, you've already got your house, right? If you were trying to buy a house in the Hamptons, it went up in price 45% year over year. If you already own the house in the Hamptons, you think, well, you know, this is great. My house is more valuable. My stocks are more valuable. Uh, you know, I'm a genius. I'm a good investor. And so if you're, if you're um, asset rich, and that's 10% of the world, you're, you just feel like everything's great. On the other hand, if you're a dentist working for $137,000 a year, the, the price of you know, early retirement and the price of all those things you ever wanted to buy is, is pulling away from you, mm. right? It, you, you can't afford to buy. It. There's something wrong when people say, we're going to pump up the price of assets to protect the economy. Because what you're doing is you're inflating the price of assets for everyone that works for a living that wanted to buy those things. What, what? And so people don't understand it because either they're, they're wealthy and they're beneficiaries of loose monetary policy, right? Or uh, I think that's the number one reason, or they're stuck in their, um, they're stuck in a frame of reference. If you have a strong ego, it's like, if, if I take you to the top of a cliff and, and I kick you off the cliff and you're humble, you would look and you see, oh, that mountain is like zooming up really fast. That's not a bubble. I'm falling, right? But if you have a strong ego, you think, oh, the mountain seems to be like going up really fast. It's a bubble. It's got to eventually come back. And, and it's just... And the issue is it's not coming back. You're going to smack into the earth because you're falling. So, I mean, I guess the best example is most Americans can't imagine their currency weakening. They're arrogant about it. If you go to Argentina, the currency weakened from one peso to the dollar to 155 pesos to the dollar over 20 years. You lost 99.5% of all your wealth because you're... You know, everything's going up in pesos. Are you getting richer or is the peso collapsing? So I think people in Zimbabwe, Venezuela and, and Argentina, they get it. They understand that if the currency is collapsing, your stocks aren't getting more valuable. So, so Michael, your house I know is that not you getting were... more valuable. You're just getting impoverished. But Americans can't conceive of American currency weakening. And so if you're stuck in the American mindset, let me just give you one more metaphor. Yeah, sure. Like I'm sucking the oxygen out of the air. If I inflate the currency by 10%, I sucked 10% of the energy out of your dollar. When I inflate the currency by 100%, I sucked half the energy out of the dollar. I'm marching you up Mount Everest. The oxygen is disappearing. You're going to get hypoxia. Eventually, you, you know, if I suck all the oxygen out of the currency, the economy collapses. And that's what happens in hyperinflation. When, I, when the current currency collapses, it's like your blood doesn't carry oxygen and the entire economy is, is ripped back to Stone Age barter. And, and practically what happens is, you know, El Salvador flips over to uh, the US dollar as the next best currency. And we just, but here, what's the problem with that? How am I supposed to get dollars? If you study the history of America before the American Revolution in the Chesapeake Bay, they used bales of tobacco as money because they, they couldn't get money. So if you use dollars in Zimbabwe or Nigeria or El Salvador and there's no bank and there's no visa and there's no Apple Pay because it's illegal, then where's your dollars coming from? 
right? I mean, and that's a, how do you operate a, a, a 21st century economy without access to a currency? And if the currency is losing its value fast enough, then you have to have an asset a, in order to store your economic energy or else you get Weimar Republic. So I, I know you got were, that different places I, in the world now. I know you were involved in uh, in uh, Elon's decision to uh, put Bitcoin on Tesla's balance sheet. We can get to that a little bit later. Uh, and I know you've been working or having conversations with sovereigns about making it the reserve currency. Um, were you involved in in uh, what happened in the Salvador, or is there other other countries that you're working to tip? You know, I mean, we're we're all communicating everybody in the in uh, the bitcoin world is working with an agenda to provide property rights to 8 billion people right i mean and that means everybody's communicating with everybody sometimes it's explicit on twitter you'll see communications back and forth and 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 we're very public about it on the record and sometimes they're back channel communications and you know if i'm talking to a you know a public company ceo or uh, you know, a politician, obviously, I keep it confidential, you know, but, uh, uh, but sometimes we're very public about it. And, uh, and Twitter's a pretty good mechanism for that. Look, I, I think the big picture here is, if you want to boil down what's going on in the world right now, uh, we figured out how a technology to give the human race property rights for the first time. We've applied engineering to economics via Bitcoin for the first time. I mean, this is equivalent to Google on, on, a, on a feature phone, right? It's giving the world access to information and m mobile telephones, giving the world access to communications and bandwidth. Uh, and this is giving them the ability to transfer energy in the same networks. Yeah, Google's information energy, and this is monetary energy, but putting this in perspective, Google spends $160 billion to create $1.6 trillion in value or market cap. And so they put $1 in to get $10 out. Bitcoin spends $4 billion to create nearly $800 billion in, in value. So you put $1 in to get up to $200 out, certainly $100 to $200. So it's, it's 10x or more more efficient use of energy to create value because you've literally got a, a big tech monetary network that is, what's Google move? It moves a video, okay? I, I get, you know, what's more valuable? Moving an image of the check or what if the check is written out for a billion dollars? Think about how valuable the information is in a billion dollar check, right? Versus the value of a picture. And so, what you've got is the highest value digital network in the history of the human race. And it's a paradigm shift, Peter, because no economist ever, there, when we went to MIT, they didn't teach course in monetary engineering. That, I mean, monetary engineering will be a course in the future, which is how do I create politically sound, thermodynamically sound, tokenized energy on a digital network? It's it's a complicated thing, but people that are people that are sensitive to it, they realize that this is an economic imperative because there's four hundred trillion dollars of assets that are losing ten percent of their value every year through currency inflation. It's a technical imperative because for the first time you can deliver property to six billion smartphones. It's going to be the it's going to be the next evolution in the mobile wave, and then it's a moral imperative. Right. Uh, I, I do think this, I do think it's a moral imperative and that's a really well, like human rights. It, it is about human rights. It's about, you know, allowing people to have the, the systems in place uh, to seek uh, abundance and prosperity to have. It's not about a, a world of luxury for them. It's a, it's a world of possibility. What did El Salvador actually pass? What did what did the uh, the country enable that's so unique? Just so folks have that piece of data. They, um, they made Bitcoin legal tender uh, in the country, which, get, which made it sort of para passu at parity with the US dollar. So the US dollar is the official currency for medium of exchange and, uh, and unit of account. And Bitcoin becomes the official currency for store value and their, and their equivalent. So they legitimized it uh, as an official uh, asset. They also... Um, they said that anybody needs to accept it as uh, as payment for debt, and that's a pretty big deal. 
uh, in the country. And then they also said there's no capital gain on the transfer. Okay, so that's a, that's a huge deal. Now, it may not be a huge deal for American citizens because American citizens have uh, obligations under the IRS tax code for 10 years after they leave the US. You know, you have to renounce your passport and wait 10 years. But if you're an international citizen, if you're an Australian or, you know, South African or whatever, and you go to, uh, to El Salvador, what it means is if you were holding highly appreciated Bitcoin, uh, you could transfer it without paying capital gains tax on it. And that's huge. So they'll probably draw a huge international community. Now, I mean, of course, it may not be so world shaking as like Singapore and UAE already have sort of tax havens. So it kind of puts them kind of asymmetrically at parity with them in a way, but it's a pretty good idea because anybody, anybody with the wherewithal might decide to settle. And of course, I think it'll probably draw businesses, any kind of Bitcoin related business that might have, um, might have a, a tax advantage might decide to locate there. And so- Or, or entrepreneurs who want to develop uh, products and programs. Let me, let me use that as a, as a moment to bring Bill Barnheit in. Uh, Bill, um, uh, take one second and, and, and what is Abra? And you mentioned earlier to me that you have a large number of users in South and Central America. Uh, could, you, could you speak to that a moment? Yeah, sure. So Abra uh, is a crypto uh, wealth management app and service. Uh, we allow you to trade uh, Bitcoin versus dollars, as well as about 140 other cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's a great way to, to get in very easily. If you're in the U.S., you can wire unlimited amounts of money in via the traditional banking system, buy Bitcoin. Uh, we run a high yield service that allows you to deposit your crypto uh, as well as cash and earn interest on it. So we currently pay about 5% on crypto deposits and about 10% on dollar deposits. And then lastly, we allow you to borrow against your Bitcoin holdings. So if you're holding Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, you can actually borrow dollars. And so... That's what we call holding the appreciating asset and borrowing uh, in, in the dollars, which is the, the depreciating asset. Now, what's really interesting about how our business has evolved over the past couple of years is that the two areas where we've seen the fastest growth are in the high net worth user base, right? It's people with uh, seven figures and up of, of assets where they're putting significant amounts of money to work in uh, in Bitcoin and Ethereum and other crypto assets because they see uh, what's happening with the money printing that Michael was talking about. The other group of people where we're growing equally fast and some regions even faster is in developing markets, particularly in markets where the currency has either gone to shit in the past, is going to shit now, um, or it's depreciating even faster than the dollar, which is true in, in, in most countries anyway, or you know, places like Venezuela or Argentina, where it's effectively going to zero and they have no choice but to adopt um, a dollar standard. So, so we've seen hundreds of thousands of users flock to Abra from places like the Philippines, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, who in the aggregate are doing as much volume in our business as the high net worth clients, many of whom are on this, this call today who are depositing millions. They're just, you know, a smaller group because there's a... Uh, fewer uh, millionaires out there. Uh, so, so it's astounding. Now, the people who probably need the most education who don't intuitively get it quite yet are the people in the middle. Because as Michael said, if you're, if you're holding a, an ETF uh, on the S&P 500 and it's going up at the same rate as currency inflation, it's not intuitively obvious that the government is actually uh, inflating your currency to be worthless. And what you're actually doing is keeping pace via some other uh, intermediary asset like a stock. And so those people who are able to keep pace, or at least not, you know, or treading water, as you will, or, or like the Flintstones cycling in place or pedaling in place forever, are the hardest to educate because they're the ones who haven't suffered the most, right? People who are really worried about inflation at large scale, high net worth, and people who have seen those assets go to zero uh, quickly are the people who uh, seem to love the ABRA model the most, uh, which I find it, it's, it's, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a model where I'll have a conversation in the morning with somebody who's going to put $15 million personally via family office or individual into Bitcoin, and then go on Twitter uh, in a few hours later and talk to some customers in, in Guatemala who are asking questions about what it means to put $10 
in Bitcoin, which might re represent a big chunk of, of family savings using exactly the same platform, the same platform. And I just uh, got to make a uh, disclosure. I'm an advisor to Abra. I hold my Bitcoin in Abra. Just want to make sure that's clear out there. Not, uh, yeah. Not, um, so, so Bill, uh, where, where do you see the, I mean, uh, the ultimate, um, uh, agility here for this in, in terms of uh, the ability to move it versus as a backward store to actually use it for daily life. Uh, is it going to be easy enough? Is it going to be something that actually is, you know, equivalent to, uh, to an Apple pay eventually? Yeah, I see, I see a, a multi-tier system emerging analogous to the existing system. And it'll look different in emerging markets like what we'll see in El Salvador, where they don't have a viable government issued currency versus the US where the dollar is not going to die, okay? Now, what's the same in both cases is people will wanna hold Bitcoin and eventually everyone will get it and everyone will understand that Bitcoin is the appreciating asset. Now, will things were, will diverge is that in the US, a lot of people will simply hold the Bitcoin and get a credit line in dollars because why would you wanna spend what's going up in value when you can spend what's going down in value? Right. So I'll take the dollar loan against the appreciating asset all day long in places like El Salvador and Guatemala and the Philippines. There, I predict that over time, our users will hold and spend Bitcoin because they effectively will have no choice, meaning that the, they won't have a dollar denominated system that's e as easily accessible. So technologies that Michael mentioned, like Lightning, which kind of look a little bit like a PayPal or an Apple Pay, but specifically for Bitcoin, make the ability to do very small dollar transactions near free, right? It's easy as taking out a dollar bill piece of paper and handing it to the person next to you using, using a smartphone. So, so I see this new kind of crypto centric or Bitcoin centric banking system emerging over the next, the next decade that takes advantages of what uh, takes advantage of what works in places like the US, Europe and probably China and what is failing in these developing markets where they may actually become completely bitcoin centric which makes total sense especially when you have a currency you can subdivide down to eight decimals i predict that in a few years in a lot of developing markets you're going to hear people quote prices in satoshis makes no sense to put a price in bitcoin where it's 0. 0.00 but if you can say the cup of coffee costs you know 0.15 satoshis that makes a lot that's going to make a lot of sense to people and if you can pay for it in a fraction of a satoshi which is effectively zero why wouldn't you do that when you have no other currency but in the us we'll simply borrow against the bitcoin and continue to use the visa rails that we have that work just fine so so can, I, where, yeah, can I break in when you get a moment I, yeah. I have two things i wanted to add i think are important um one um i think it's pretty important for people to understand that <clears throat> One of the reasons that Bitcoin is an economic imperative, even in the developed world, is that most of the assets that people hold in the US and Europe are currency derivatives. <clears throat> like uh, if you own a value stock, it's, it's valued based on the value of the discounted cash flows. And if you own real estate, it's valued based upon the rents. And if you own a bond, it's valued based upon the coupon. And so if the currency is losing 15% of its value a year, then you have to apply a 15% discount rate to all those currency derivatives. And you look out 10 years and you realize that, that even though right now they might have got a bump in this V-shaped recovery or K-shaped recovery, ultimately, if we have a loose money policy in the Western world, then they're all collapsing. And that's why you'd want a non-sovereign bearer instrument store of value that's not based on cash flows. And I, I would just suggest everybody apply this mental model in their head. If you were running a business in Argentina, and if I told you that the Argentine currency was going to collapse from three pesos to the dollar to 150 pesos to the dollar over the next 15 years, and then you tried to figure out what your investment strategy should be, should you own Argentine bonds, Argentine stocks, Argentine commercial real estate, or Argentine cash, or should you own something else? The answer is, there isn't any strategy in a collapsing currency. There is no mix of conventional assets that saves you because they're all eventually going to get ripped down by the collapse of the underlying currency. 
So the only logical strategy when the, as the currency starts to collapse faster is you have to convert your monetary energy into an asset which is not a currency derivative in the frame of reference you're in, right? And so once you understand that idea, it's a big idea, then, you, then the light bulb goes off and you say, well, in 2003, I should convert all my pesos to dollars because that's a stronger currency than peso. But in 2021, I should convert something to like a Bitcoin because that's stronger than the peso and stronger than the dollar. And it's a frame of reference. So that's the first big idea. And it's important because it plays to the $400 trillion of conventional assets in the world. And it's why Bitcoin is a superior asset because it really doesn't have that currency derivative risk and counterparty risk. And I think the second big idea um, is... I do think we're going to actually see an explosion of, of stable coins. Uh, and that means that uh, things like uh, Tether and DAI and USDC are dollars on crypto rails. And we're going to see an explosion. Uh, there's probably already $75 billion worth of this stuff circulating around. But we're going to see hundreds of billions of dollars of dollars circulating through Africa, Asia. It's already happening in China. Uh, people are already circulating on crypto rails, U.S. dollars. And um, I, I predict that what you'll see is five or six billion people with a mobile device and they'll have a, a, a software wallet and the wallet will have digital currencies and digital assets. And the king currency would be the dollar. And after that, maybe the euro or the yen or, or renminbi. And then the digital asset will be the Bitcoin and maybe some other digital assets. And uh, sometimes people think, well, if Bitcoin spreads, the dollar has to be replaced. Not really. It's what really happens with money is when you have a hyperinflation of money, if money inflates it more than five to 10% a year, you have a delamination of the roles of money and the medium of exchange unit of account becomes the currency controlled by the sovereign government like the U.S., Weak governments adopt the U.S. currency, like El Salvador, and then uh, the store of value devolves to the asset. And so you have currency versus asset, and everybody in the world is going to want both. They'll want the asset for the long term, and they'll want the currency for the short term. And the strongest asset will be Bitcoin. Another asset is S&P 500 index. Another <laughs> asset is any other crypto. Another asset would be anything you can digitize, you know, and people will flip between the US dollar and the local currency. You can even see a three tier. I have a million dollars in, in Bitcoin. I have $100,000 in US and I have $1,000 in the local Zimbabwe currency because the government forces me to. And I swap between the three and in common sense is I hold the weakest currency for a week. I hold the next currency for a year. And I hold the asset forever. And uh, that, that's evolving. There'll, there'll be open source things like Lightning Wallet that can run anywhere in the world. And they're what we call open source decentralized. And then you've got PayPal, Apple Pay, Square that are centralized payment rails and Visa and MasterCard. And I... You know, a lot of people in the world can't use MasterCard and Visa Mike, and Apple. Michael, let me let me jump in here a second. There are two questions I had asked you once, and I want to hear yeah. your your answers and as well as Bill. The, the first is um, to the members watching. Uh, when you think about what percent of your of your assets or your cash, to use that word, U.S. dollars, um, you're advising your family and friends to hold in something like Bitcoin. Love that. And then the second, how do you address the wild fluctuations in price and what the ultimate value could be as compared to a store of value in gold? Can you hit on those two subjects for a second? For money, for money that you need, like in our business, we have $50 million in US dollar and we have that as working capital for stuff we think we need in the 12 month period. So we calculate the full, the full fluctuation or volatility of our cash needs over the next 12 months. We keep that in a very stable currency that's denominated in the same units as the obligations. And then stuff we're not gonna need, we call treasury, and then we invest in our treasury assets. We invest in Bitcoin, but, but my advice to anybody would be establish a treasury policy and, the, and the, the right thing to hold for a decade 
would be a portfolio of scarce assets that will go up in value in the, in the face of inflation. So it, I'm biased toward Bitcoin, but if you're not going to do Bitcoin, I mean, for God's sake, uh, buy a nice house you want to live in forever, right? Buy furniture you want to use forever, buy useful, buy commodities, you know, that you uh, can use, buy, uh, buy, if you, if you want to buy stock, buy high quality stocks that you think will be able to raise their revenues or their cash flows faster than the rate of money expansion. I would rather own Apple and Facebook and Google, like a, a dominant digital monopoly that can, you know, Apple can roll out a new product to, to a billion people over the weekend. So their ability to create value is higher. I wouldn't own a 19th century manufacturer because there's no way they can deploy a product to a billion people over the weekend. So, so buy companies that will last for the long term, buy assets that people will want over the long term. Buy something scarce, something desirable, because if I, if I increase the amount of U.S. dollars by a factor of 10, ask yourself the question, will the stuff that I own be 10 times more valuable or not? And I think common sense will answer that question. That's for such you. a fundamental question that people don't address. So Bitcoin is at 62,000, you know, six weeks ago, it's at 37, 38,000 now, the wild fluctuations in price. How do you think about that? I think that um, if, you're, if you're buying Bitcoin with a time horizon of less than four years, I don't think you should buy it. I, you know, no one's ever lost money buying Bitcoin and holding it over four years. But if you're, if you're buying, if, if you want something to not fluctuate in value in four weeks or four months, then you should buy something else. So it all comes down to time horizon. The volatility itself is, uh, is because it's not controlled. It's a global market. Anybody can trade it 24-7. You could, if people could trade Apple stock on, on Saturday night in Singapore with 10x leverage, okay, you would have more volatility in Apple stock, right? Uh, but so what you've got is you've got exchanges that give you a lot more leverage. You can get, you know, you, you can read something on Twitter at 10.32 p.m. on Saturday night and panic, and then you can sell it, and then someone else will pile on to that. And, and there, there are reasons it's volatile. One reason is because it trades with 10x leverage. No one trades with more than 2x leverage on the U.S. stock exchange. With equity, you can't. So it trades with more leverage. It trades everywhere in the world. The other reason it's more volatile, Peter, is because it's property, not a security. And that means it's not subject to the 30-day wash rule. The IRS says, if you were to dump Apple stock right now at a 20% loss, you have to wait 30 days to buy it back. And so you would think, well, I might not, I like it long-term. So I think I'll take my lumps and I'm just gonna hold it. I'm not gonna trade it. You can't dump it on Saturday night while you're drunk. You can't dump it on 10X leverage and you can't dump it on Saturday night with 10X leverage and buy it back on Sunday morning, you see? But, okay, so Bitcoin and crypto in general, it's the wild west, it's true price discovery, it's true freedom. There is more volatility. We could say, oh, this is a bad thing, but is it really a bad thing? Because on one hand, you would say the hedge funds will sell a billion dollars at a 20% loss knowing they can buy it back four hours later and harvest the tax gain. You could say that's a bad thing, but you could say that's a good thing because hedge funds everywhere in the world think this is a much more favorable asset class to trade. So let's if do a calculation go. for the group here. Simple uh, math about uh, if Bitcoin achieves a store of value similar to gold, what the price uh, ends up being. It goes to about five. It depends on how you look at it, but anywhere from three hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollars a coin. Okay. Gold's like a ten trillion dollar asset class. Some of it's jewelry, though. Four billion, five billion is jewelry. So, so the monetary portion of gold is five to six trillion dollars, and and so that means Bitcoin goes up to three hundred thousand, three hundred fifty thousand if it just replaces that monetary supply. Bill, you want to add anything about uh, uh, the fluctuations and volatility and price? And uh, uh, yeah, so so we we talk about this all the time with high net worth clients. We talk about time horizon constantly, and I agree. I mean, we we usually quote three years, but but if your if your time horizon is less than three to four years, you're doing it for the wrong reason, and you're going to be disappointed at some point. 
right? But when you have an asset class that's going up one to 300% a year and versus another asset class in the dollar or, or fiat currencies, which are basically being printed into, uh, you know, worthlessness, right? So, so what, what, is it, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? You know, we run our treasury at, at, at a much smaller scale, the same way, the same way Mike was talking about. We're, we're profitable, so we keep a certain amount of cash. We generate our revenue in Bitcoin, and, and we're comfortable leaving it there. Uh, because we're no, we want to be the, the crypto bank for people for the next hundred years, and we're putting our money where our mouth is, and it's been great for us. But again, we tell people, you know, if you're if you're day trading Bitcoin, right, uh, you know, and you don't know what you're doing, you're probably going to get wiped out, especially when there's people who are trading with. It's actually not even 10x. You can actually trade with 100x leverage, which you know, for most Americans, is just complete insanity. But that's the reality. The second thing I would say is we're on the front lines as early Bitcoin holders towards the creation of a new asset class, a digital asset class that didn't exist before that's growing exponentially. You need to look at, to truly understand this, in my opinion, you need to look at the price of Bitcoin on, on log charts, not linear charts. It's very difficult to look at hockey sticks uh, and then you know not expect... Or, or even to, to fully appreciate what's going on when you're on the front lines. We've never had a new asset class created like this before. So when I explain it to people, I take out a log chart and say, look, you know, a 25, 30% pullback in price is irrelevant when you've got a system that's being adopted exponentially, but has a, a, a finite, right, as, as guaranteed finite scarcity. Right. And we've never had that before. So it's very, first of all, it's, 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 it's difficult for most human beings to get their mind around exponential growth or, or just compound interest. But now we're talking about something going up 200% a year. It's very difficult. Right. So we're so, going to go to uh, member, member questions now, really. Uh, Justin, uh, you were patient. Please uh, jump on in. Yeah, thanks. First of all, I can imagine Peter and Michael's fraternity. Wow, that had to be. Some <laughs> it, it was an guys. intense place. It was. Yeah, it wow. Was. It was Man, very intense. Yeah. And Peter and yeah. I are both Aero Astros, too. Yeah. Right, there you go. To Man, the moon. I used to so, cheat off the, of uh, Michael's uh, problem sets because he's just smarter <laughs> than I am. He's a liar. Right, he was go. four years ahead of me. I looked at all of his course notes and problem sets. Yep. I had the benefit <laughs> of him going first. Go ahead. <laughs> yep. There you go. Sure. No problem. The, um, so it's interesting. I'm, I'm a simplifier. So I like to simplify things. And, um, you know, I look at the San Jose Sharks, you know, first NHL team, you talk about hockey sticks, uh, Bill, you know, they're the first NHL team a couple of days to adopt Bitcoin. And you saw uh, the Ivy League last year in the spring was the first big league to shut down everything because of COVID. And then you look at El Salvador to be the first country to adopt, uh, you know, legal tender Bitcoin. So you have the wealthiest elite at one end and then the poorest of the poor, right. like you said, Bill, but, you know, the, the black and white and in the middle. So, so my question is, where, where does the gray start to come in and where, how does it get adopted to the gray? Meaning, is it more teams like the NHL Sharks or the NBA's Kings or the Oakland A's? which they have, have adopted Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in some aspect, or is it, uh, I've seen Bitcoin machines and gas stations a few times. Is it that, like, what's the mechanism to getting it to not the poorest of the poor and not the wealthiest, this is the wealthiest, which is most of the people in this room, but where, where's the middle? How does it get? It's already there? happening. It's already happening. Look, it's the fastest adopted technology in history to my knowledge. Right. I mean, Michael, correct me if I've got, if I've got this wrong, but I've never seen the internet itself. Right, it was not adopted. Smartphones, which we referred to ten years ago as the fastest adopted new technology on the planet, right? We're not as uh, uh, we're not as quickly adopted as Bitcoin is being adopted now. I believe we're at about 160 to 175 million uh, Bitcoin wallets that are out there. Obviously, they hold other cryptocurrencies in addition to Bitcoin, like with Abra. But uh, it's happening already. I think you know. There's one important point to make. It's an open protocol that's permissionless, which means that any, any company on earth and anybody can adopt it anytime they want. And so to Bill's point, I think we're adding 3 million people a week. At least, yeah. 3 million a week. 
and it is spreading faster than anything else. It's the fastest growth of a digital network in the history of the world, faster than Google or Facebook or Apple uh, to value. But now how does it spread? Well, look, like MicroStrategy, one company starts buying it, and now every one of our shareholders, every one of our employees, every one of our debt holders, I just, I just uh, sold a bond issuance and 100, and 100 institutions, and they collectively represent about $20 trillion of assets participated. So one way it happens is corporations get involved. Another way is all the banks are getting involved, and, and uh, the banks will deliver it. I think uh, Coinbase adds, added a million accounts a week. Uh, Bills companies adding millions of accounts. Binance is. Square is adding millions and millions of accounts. So it's going to be spread by big tech. U ultimately, I think that the most powerful dynamics going to be 6 billion mobile phones with Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin software or Bitcoin uh, assets on the mobile phone. I mean, that's how you really deliver it to the world. But you can't underestimate the power. Like when an insurance company buys Bitcoin and they've got, or Fidelity, Fidelity's got 20 million customers and insurance company's got 50 million customers. When they buy Bitcoin, you just delivered an insurance policy that's a derivative of Bitcoin to 50 million people, right? If a government, let's say government, uh, if El Salvador buys Bitcoin, then any currency issued by El Salvador becomes a Bitcoin derivative. Like here's a good idea. Turkey goes and prints uh, Turkish lira, buys billions of dollars of Bitcoin, announces it, and now the entire everybody in Turkey is carrying Turkish lira, which is a Bitcoin derivative. It's backed by Bitcoin in their pocket. So, so this is this spreads. In lots of different ways, every corporation, every government, in essence, can create derivatives of Bitcoin simply by owning the Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And every big tech company can build Bitcoin and the protocol into their software. And uh, is there any one? No, there's like 10,000 entities that are acting simultaneously, independently. You know, there's stuff going on in Korea and Japan right now and, and Singapore and China. We don't even know about. And the beauty of Bitcoin is somebody you saw the president said, we're just going to take our volcano and we're going to punch a hole and, and we're going to vent out 95 megawatts of power. 95 megawatts of power will generate three exahash, which will give you three percent almost 3% of the revenues of the Bitcoin network, which means 3% of $20 billion, right? So you're talking about $600 million a year from a volcano. Did anybody ask permission? No. Can you do it in Iceland or Greenland? Sure you can. Can you fire up a nuclear reactor in Siberia? Yep. You know, can I keep track of it? Nope. Do I, can't? not even trying, it's the power of a decentralized permissionless protocol. People that you, and here's the other irony, Peter, I'll make this, I apologize, but- Dude, don't apologize, you a, you're changing- If you got a billion dollars, yeah. if you have a billion dollars in New York and you put it in gold, you're depending upon the mayor of Manhattan and the governor of New York and the United States uh, government to protect your billion dollars. If you have a billion in Bitcoin, then, there's going to be a Bitcoin miner in Siberia and another one in Xizhuan and another one that might be in Venezuela. And they're protecting your billion dollars. The enemy of your enemy of your enemy is actually protecting your asset without even knowing that they're doing it. Because somebody in China thinks he's got extra hydroelectric power and they just want to utilize it. So the, the incentives of Bitcoin are to drive everybody everywhere on earth to do innovative things all the time without asking permission from anybody else. Instead of having a chain as strong as its weakest link, the chain is as strong as its strongest link. One, got, one last point. There's a basis trade in Singapore. You can sell the forward future. You can buy the spot. You can lock in 35% overnight interest. Americans can't do it legally, but if you have a pool of billions of dollars of capital in China or Russia or Cayman Islands, you can go get 35% overnight interest. And if you live in Alabama and you take one Bitcoin and bury it in your backyard and don't think about it for a decade, 
you're getting the benefit of some trader in Russia or China or Hong Kong taking advantage of that trade. And so it is truly a beautiful global network where, where money managers are driving up the value of your asset and then Bitcoin miners are driving up the security of your asset and you can be asleep for 30 years and, and somebody that you don't know in some place you don't know will do something that's illegal in the place you live without you knowing it to your benefit. Amazing. That's Bitcoin. I, Michael, I, I, you know, I hope everybody is appreciating why this is such an important conversation. Joe, uh, Joe Honan, you're next. Hi, thanks, Peter. Uh, hey, Michael and Bill, I enjoyed both of your talks at the Bitcoin conference last week. Appreciate that very much. I wanted to ask you both, hopefully a little bit of a sensitive question, because I want to amp up the conversation here a little bit. So, Michael, for you, I'd love to understand what your view about this whole Bitcoin maximalism, one coin to rule them all kind of scenario is versus other altcoins. Many of them have outperformed Bitcoin over the last 12 months. So I'd love to understand that. And then for you, Bill, things like MetaMask and, and, these, and these decentralized wallets that aren't, that aren't centralized, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. And if you think that that is a, a threat to your business uh, over, over- Yeah, sure. Let me, let me address the first one. I think you've got crypto assets and you've got crypto applications and the idea of a crypto asset is I want to build, I want to put a billion dollars on a network that'll be here a hundred years from now. So I'm all about durability and integrity, and I don't want anybody to mess with the functionality or to break the thing. And so I don't want any more functionality. I just want to put a billion dollars on a, on a coin and wait a thousand years. And a thousand years from now, you could make these incremental security improvements but the truth is a billion dollars of money now and a billion dollars of money a thousand years from now, it's, it's fine. So the theory behind Bitcoin is, is optimize the architecture so it doesn't change, it's secure, it's in high integrity. And all the functionality is on the layer two. And so the, the functionality, which is perform applications, performance and functionality speed, you can get that from Square Cash App. That's a compliant app and you can move a billion transactions a day for free. It has to be compliant and you trust Jack Dorsey and Square or you do on a PayPal or you do on a Visa or you do on a MasterCard or you build an application with the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is a decentralized staked network where you stake Bitcoin in order to do a billion transactions instant fast and you build functionality. Each of those app, by the way, you can also use Ethereum or use any other crypto asset. So I could, if I wanted to move money privately, I could flip it from Bitcoin to Monero or Bitcoin to Zcash, and I use their functionality. And if I wanted to do smart contracts or DeFi, I could flip from Bitcoin and I could wrap the Bitcoin in Ethereum or go to Cardano or go to Binance Smart Chain or go to Solana. You have a whole set of applications I think you have decentralized applications. We'll call those crypto apps. And the idea is I do proof of stake because I need super high speed and I can't afford a proof of work. And uh, those tend to be more centralized, but higher performance. And then, you, and then you change and upgrade the functionality. There's an entire market dynamic. Nobody knows whether Ethereum beats Binance Smart Chain or whether or not Ethereum destroys central banking or, or, or fractional reserve banking. I don't have an opinion on that. I do have an opinion that, that um, there's a layer one, which is just give me a billion dollar bearer instrument asset. And if there's an open protocol, then all the functionality should come from the layer two. And, and as Gary Gensler would say, you have basically permissionless blockchains and permissioned blockchains. A proof of stake is sort of more permissioned. It's higher performance. It's, it's, it's more decentralized and more fault tolerant than a, than a centralized conventional app. And there are a lot of benefits there if you want something like that. But we're not going to shut down Visa or Apple Pay either. And so I, I would say um, 
Bitcoin serves this role as like a long-term hundred-year-old store of value. <coughs> and if what you want is that integrity and trust, and you don't want people monkeying with the system, then that's Bitcoin. If you go to Ethereum, they're changing the system all the time, right? I mean, they're going to go from Ethereum 1.0 to 2.0. And if you listen to Charles Hoskinson, he'll say, next quarter, we're releasing this feature. And next quarter, we're releasing this feature. And so those are decentralized but quasi-engineered pursuits of technology functionality. And the idea of money, base layer money, is why couldn't I just have 1% of all the money in the human race for 10,000 years without changing the functionality, right? So they're different things and they're engineered to a different purpose. Ultimately, the applications will live or die based upon competing with other application functionality. And the assets will live or die based upon who's got the best asset. I don't think I would say it's impossible to have other assets. Like the Chinese could create a crypto asset that might, that might sit out there. But you know, an asset is deflationary, looks on the surface better than one that's inflationary. Bitcoin competes against Bitcoin Cash. Same kind of architecture. I like one better than the other one. Other people might like the one that moves a little bit faster with a higher block size. The marketplace determines it. And, uh, and in terms of uh, overall architectures, look, there's a, and it, if I create a virtual currency in a virtual world and I create a virtual network and give it to my virtual friends, and if they stake that virtual currency to create virtual security so I can trade virtual products, I'll be virtually successful until one of my virtual friends copies my virtual idea, which is virtually certain. Okay. And so <laughs> that's, that's like Farmville or Second Life or Fortnite. By the way, you can't say they're not successful. Fortnite is successful. It's a game. You can't say, you know, casinos have casino chips. They're successful. You can have a DeFi. Michael, I want to get through the other questions. So I'm gonna, I, dude, I yeah, can, so I'll wind, shut up. I can wind I you up. Say and... There's a market dynamic here and the market has a place for all these things. I, I don't think you can dismiss them. I just think they're going to sort itself out depending upon what you want. Yeah, agreed. The functionality. Bill, your question. Yeah, so so look, I, I, I agree in terms of the store of value role for Bitcoin. I see myself as a, as a, a very, I have a simplistic perspective uh, for store value. Uh, I think it's it's uh, you know it's it's the Sistine Chapel of cryptography of mathematics in terms of Bitcoin being able to be the ultimate store of value. Um, and so I put that aside and say, look, you know, I want that to evolve at as slow a rate as possible. If it works, don't break it, don't fuck with it. However, there are other applications of, you know, Michael referred to them as crypto apps. And we're in inning one of, of understanding what the potential there is. Uh, is Ethereum going to enable them at scale, right? So, you know, obviously uh, stable coins being one that we've talked about, right? All built upon mostly Ethereum and others like Stellar and other networks are starting to come up. You know, DeFi applications, which might replace applications of centralized banking, insurance, other services for yield generation, uh, which may actually move to Bitcoin at some point, but haven't yet, right? Um, you know, arts, collectibles, uh, you know, you've referred to them as, as NFT sometimes, all basically also being built on a, um, a layer, other layer, competing layer one protocols like Ethereum, Wax, uh, Solana, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, our take is, is that that is going to be uh, a massive market, which is getting, and, and, and uh, for me, as somebody who's been at this, you know, from my Netscape days to now, the, the, the developer support tends to be a key indicator for me, right? And if you look at where developer interest is going, it's moving in the direction of these crypto-based apps. Bitcoin doesn't need a massive army of layer one protocol developers, right? Uh, it, it really needs stability. It needs to be secure. It needs to be reliable, right? Crypto apps to figure it out is going to need the Charles Hoskins name developers rapid experimentation. start some massive radical experimentation. Exactly. And you know, the other question about uh, MetaMask, you know, as, as kind of a, a user interface, right? This is indicative of where we are. The average person cannot use MetaMask. It's too complicated. 
right? So one of the things we're looking at at Abra is how do we actually create user experiences that are viable for the average consumer to be able to take advantage of decentralized applications at scale? But we're so early, right? This is still, we're guys, we're still in the deceptive out. phase going to disruptive, right? I mean, we talk about this whenever you digitize something and enters a, a deceptive phase, and then 30 doublings later, it's a billion fold improvement. It's, you know, disruptive, demonetizes, democratizes, right. right? So that's what we're doing in this regard. Right. Um, uh, can, can I go to Ken's Peter, question next? Real quick, I'd, I'd love to say to Bill, I've used Abra for four or five years, probably five years since I saw you at A360 many years ago. And it's a fantastic app. So I, I, I'm one of your AUMs on that. So it's uh -huh. Appreciate that. Appreciate Ken that. Sim, you're next. Hey, uh, thank you so much. Uh, questions for all three of you, uh, Michael, Bill, and Peter. If you have a long-term view, uh, what mix would you sort of put in Bitcoin versus Ether and why? Long-term being 10,000 year or long-term like a couple hundred year lifespan, which- <laughs> A couple hundred years. Well, I'll go first because my answer is simple. I think Bitcoin can go up by a factor of a hundred and it's a hundred times less risky than everything else. And it, and the human race needs a base layer of digital gold money. And, it's, and, and base money is a winner-take-all phenomenon. So if the addressable market for base money is $200 trillion and you've got one solution and it's first, the path dependence suggests that it goes to $200 trillion. So everything else is 100 times riskier and 100 times smaller. So it's 10,000 times less compelling. So 100% Bitcoin, 0% everything else and then wait for the other 10,000 applications to find their home. And if, if something's as successful as Google, it's worth a trillion or two trillion. But I'm thinking that there's only one thing that's been invented in the history of the human race that's worth $200 trillion and you're staring at it. So why would you, why would you squander your capital on anything that is less compelling when you have the single, it's like, I invented electricity and you can own 1% of all the electricity the human race is ever going to use. Or you're John D. Rockefeller, you can own 5% of all the chemical energy or oil the human race is ever going to use. Or how about 5% of the fire we're ever going to burn? I mean, the way you get really rich is own the thing. And so how do you really that's feel what like I think. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, where do you end? Yeah, I'll give you. Uh, I, have a, I have a more. Uh, I let's let's call it a more nuanced answer. But I, I would say, you know, look, I'm going to give you my perspective on the, the the crypto part of of a portfolio, and you can decide within that which piece goes into crypto. Uh, because I've got friends that are 100 percent in the model I'm describing, and friends that are one percent in the model I'm describing. I think it's it for me that 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 one versus 100 percent comes down to time horizon. Uh, and basically emotions, right? If you're the kind of person, regardless of time horizon, who just can't deal with the, the volatility, can't think in terms of looking at a log chart versus a linear chart, then you, know, you need to move towards the 1% scale until you basically can adjust your emotions to deal with what I'm saying. So within that, you know, I'm gonna be 90% Bitcoin, probably 10% you know, Ethereum. And then separately from that mix, and then the reason is, is because right now Ethereum owns everything that's not, that's not true store value, right? And, and I also, for my cash, you know, I, I will put that in, I will hold more cash right now than I normally would because I'm earning 10% on it. If I can't safely pay that 10% uh, interest, I'm going to dramatically lower the amount of cash I'm holding. Um, and, and so, you know, I am totally comfortable with having 70% of, of my, you know, net worth in Bitcoin and, you know, let's call it another 10% in Ethereum, the rest in, 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 in everything else with a small amount of cash earning 10%. And that's what I tell everyone. Yeah. And I say, if you can't handle the risk and if you can't stop staring at the charts all day and the price all day, then you need to adjust your mindset because you're either not thinking long-term enough, you don't understand well enough why you're doing it, right? Don't do it because Bill said put... 70% in, or Michael said, put 100% in. You need to understand what sound money is, what inflation, how inflation erodes the value of your money over time, what an asset is versus a currency, right? If you can't understand that, then you're never going to get past the emotional issues that I'm talking about. Yeah. Trent, your next pal. Thanks, Peter. 
Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is I, I wanted to hear your thoughts um, uh, about wallet security. Um, the reason I, I bring this up is, is uh, I have a, a ledger wallet that, um, that about six months after I had, had put all my crypto on it, I, I received a couple of messages through Ledger um, that I had, that there were two different attempts of somebody trying to access my wallet uh, from China. And, uh, and they told me what to do in that scenario and, and, you know, and, and everything ended up uh, okay. But, uh, but that just gave me pause as far as what's the actual security of what's on my crypto, my hardware wallet. Um, and, and my second question is, is that um, I think a, a, obviously a very important part of Bitcoin's case for being a store of value um, is the fact that there's no one person or entity that's in charge of it and no one can produce more than the 21 million Bitcoins. Um, and my question is, is this exclusive to Bitcoin? Since I know most other coins can be, you know, printed, if you will, or they can be altered uh, by either a person or a, a company or group. Um, so is this, is this exclusive to Bitcoin or are there others that also um, have the same protocol? And by the way, can I just one, say one thing while I'm on this? Um, if you're watching on the YouTube link, uh, please, uh, <clears throat> we've had some scam artists on, on past uh, transmissions we've had where people are saying, send 0.3 Bitcoin here and I'll send you Bitcoin. Please be careful. Uh, don't, don't fall for any scams. No, no viable service provider will ever ask you to send Bitcoin to them for any valid reason whatsoever. It doesn't exist. Uh, I, so don't do it. Michael. Okay, so quickly answering your question, I think Bitcoin's by far the most decentralized, you know, crypto network in the world. And if I look at the monetary universe or the economic universe, I think the Bitcoin is the single most predictable, most stable, uh, highest integrity body in that universe. So if there's if you're asking me about the volume of any stock, any index, any credit, any real estate, any currency or, or anything on Earth, I think that the one thing that's more certain than any of those things is 21 million Bitcoin is the limit. And uh, I think it's it's uh, it's properly decentralized in such a way that I can't see anybody in the world with the power to change that. And that I that I think is important because that gives you the fulcrum. You know, if I if I have a, a, a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, I can move the world. Bitcoin is the fulcrum of, of, against which you can apply leverage. Other things aren't. My second observation on the on the wallet question: there's hundreds of different approaches. You know, I would tell my father, you know, buy a grayscale stock and don't actually hold your keys because he can't. If you're you know, other uh, institutions by nature are going to either want to own a fund or institutions will want to own their Bitcoin with an institutional grade audited Sarbanes-Oxley compliant custodian because they have to. If you're high net worth office, who knows, maybe you wanna, you'll want to uh, take personal custody, maybe you won't. If you choose to take custody, you could do it, you know, you can buy it, smash buy it on Square Cash App. That's a very simple experience. You can do it on exchange, a more complicated experience. You can try to do it in a hardware wallet that's more complicated. You can try to memorize a 12 phrase seed key. Seed key That's more complicated. 24 phrases is even more complicated. Is there a right answer? No, there's not a right answer. What I would say is, you know, you've got the crypto anarchist that, that are, end, are on one end of the scale, which is they're ready for the entire meltdown of every government on earth. And God bless them. We need them because they keep everybody honest and, and their conviction and their integrity is what prevents the corruption of most of the rest of the network. But I would say the optionality to take custody is, it's like they say, you know, I, I have a gun and you know I have a gun. And for the rest of my life when we're together, you know I have a gun, but hopefully I don't ever shoot the gun. Right. So if you have the option to leave, people treat you better. If you have the option to take custody, they treat you better. If you should take custody, you can take custody in a hundred different ways. There are some things that are complicated and risky. Right. right. I know people that you know, have cabins in the woods with machine guns and three years worth of food. And I believe in their freedom. They should have the freedom to do that. But I don't choose to do that. And so let me, let me, maybe I don't think you have to self-custody in order to own Bitcoin. But I would suggest 
you're in a better position when you buy it to have the option if you can. But even then, look, you're an insurance company. I'd rather the insurance company buy the fund, you know, because it's better than not buying it. And they can't do what an individual could do. And we just got to- you were going to add on to that. Then I'm going to go to Gary next. Yeah, two, two things. One, uh, you know, I, I look, I, I had the long hair, the earring. I was a cryptographer. I was part of the cypherpunk movement. On uh, the mailing list in the '90s, so so I I agree. We need that we need that community. Two things I would say. One, you know, this all comes down to the fact that Bitcoin's best feature is is its lack of centralized governance, right? Which means that there's no benevolent dictator that's going to say, "Oh, half the Bitcoins disappeared, so we got to raise the limit to 42 million Bitcoin," right? That that lack of benevolent dictator means it moves at a snail's pace, a slower than snail's pace, and it will forever. And that's a feature, not a bug. Okay. Many people think it's a bug. I actually think it's probably its best feature. Okay. Two, in terms of personal custody, right? You know, obviously I'm biased towards Abra for both retail and institutional clients, but I think our best feature is in that regard personal control. You don't use a service that doesn't let you move the crypto off if you want to or on when you want to, whether it's Abra or anybody else. Right. For most people, ledgers are simply too complicated. The, the only people I know that successfully do that are very like technically astute, can deal with the nuances of, of a ledger. Every time I have a degree in computer science, every time I use a ledger, I got to relearn how to use it. Right? It's, it's just not meant. Those little tiny displays are not meant for the non-techie, in my humble opinion. But if you are going to trust someone else for what is meant to be a trustless system, then make damn sure you can get out when you want to as well as as easily as you can get in when you want to and test that. Right? Gary, your next bell. It, Gary? Yeah, go ahead. First, uh, thank you very much for this morning. Uh, it's been very informative. I'd like to hear both of your opinions with regard to U.S. regulators and where we stand right now, in particular with the impairment rules with the SEC and also with the IRS and what some of these uh, activities are, what pressure it's putting on those uh, regulatory agencies such as El Salvador, uh, Japan and other countries. Yeah, yeah I think it's gonna be, uh, Bitcoin's legitimized as di a digital asset. And I think there's consensus forming everywhere in the world that it's a digital asset. I think that uh, the, the decision that would be a digital currency is much more controversial. In El Salvador, they designated a currency, but I think most places in the world, it will be designated as an asset, not a currency. You can expect to have it deemed as property or a commodity. You'll have tax rules. You'll, you'll pay capital gains tax short or long term when you transfer it per any other asset. And I think... Uh, you can expect uh, AML, KYC regulations around regulated custodians comparable to any other asset. If you're going to hold a, a million dollars worth of stock or a million dollars worth of currency or a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, you'll probably have the same disclosure obligations. I think the good news is we're past the point where there's a question of whether it would be banned. It's very clear that it won't be banned as property or as an asset as long as you hold it, uh, you know, subject to AML KYC. I think there's a lot of debate back and forth over how much AML KYC there'll be, and there'll be a lot of noise there. And I think that I, I don't think most of the world will ad adopt it as a medium of exchange. I think the medium of exchange is going to be the dollar. I think that we'll do transactions on high-speed payment rails with dollars. I think that we will we will store in our investment accounts Bitcoin and as a long term. And as for the other things like impairment, yeah, the gap uh, FASB right now requires that companies treat it as an indefinite and tangible for gap accounting. Um, there's a movement afoot to get them to review that. Uh, Tom Emmer wrote a letter signed by seven congressmen to FASB. I think, the, I think we'll see what happens there. Anything could happen. The consensus of, of, I think, most people in the industry is that FASB should review it um, because the last time they really opined on it, they simply took the most conservative treatment because no one was really using it. Yeah. Bill, you want to add anything there? 
Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, uh, one, I think we have a lot more regulatory clarity than people think. Uh, we deal with, you know, users in 100 countries. I meet with central banks all over the world. Um, you know, most countries, the storage of crypto is dealt with via e-money uh, and money transmission licensing, which implies KYC and AML uh, rules that Michael was alluding to. Uh, the SEC does not oversee Bitcoin. Uh, the only time the SEC is, is involved is if there's some attempt to securitize Bitcoin, such as with the Grayscale product or with hedge funds that are largely unregulated because they deal with the credit and investors, or more importantly, with these pending ETF applications, which up until now they have not been willing to approve. Uh, but eventually, they, I believe they will. Um, and, and in most countries, uh, they also deem Bitcoin a commodity and, and, the, and the virtual currency uh, rules tend to apply again, which puts you uh, in well-defined e-money or in the US MSB uh, money transmission regulation. Thank you. Let's go to Judy next. Judy. Uh, superb conversation. And I think the points just recently about the clarity on currency versus assets helped uh, me a lot. Question. In the developing countries like African nations, we're really seeing an emergence of uh, financial data, API tech companies to merge, you know, citizens permissioned. Um, maybe the data hasn't been collected yet and merging that all other so they can get access to, to financial institutions. And I'm, you know, I think you've said Bitcoin ap applications are more for, you know, longer term assets. But do you see a risk of, of this merging technology on, a, on the API front being leapfrogged? And if so, you know, in this deceptive to disruptive, how long do you think that would take to happen? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think it's like TCP IP. It's a base layer protocol and all the innovation and all the risk is being taken at the application layer. So the leapfrogging is going on between PayPal and Square and Lightning and Ethereum and Binance Smart Chain and Solana and everybody else in the space. And there's a massive war over who's gonna create the most compelling applications. The underlying base layer of Bitcoin would allow any of, if, if PayPal wanted to settle with Square every four hours for $97 million, they can do it with the underlying blockchain. So what you just need is, is a, a base layer monetary protocol to allow hundreds of thousands of innovators to do their thing. And they are, right? In Zimbabwe, you'll have a regulated mobile app in Zimbabwe that'll be using the Bitcoin protocol and they'll be compliant to Zimbabwe. And then the government will change the rule and they will change their app and they will fail and they will succeed. You know, it'll be a free for all. But I think that... Uh, that the key with Bitcoin is, is they perfected a monetary, a digital monetary network for the first time in human history. It wasn't the first try. It was just the first successful one. Now it works. Now everybody has a frame of reference and a protocol and it's spreading like wildfire. And so, no, I don't think the protocol gets leaped. I think the key is it's like English language. It's, you know, once, once you have the language, companies come and go, people come and go, governments come and go, the language, it kind of evolves a bit, but it's pretty sticky. Or, you know, when I was a kid, they, they were trying to switch out the English system for the metric system. That was 50 years ago. That, that was going to happen presently. It still hasn't happened in the U.S. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Check your wall, Jack, and look at the electric power plugs in the U.S. versus Europe and ask yourself, when's that switching? And the answer is the protocol is just incredibly difficult. You did, is, is it the best one? No, it's not the best one. Like there's always a theoretical better one, but uh, it, if a billion people all agree on the protocol and it gets trillions of dollars of monetary energy behind it, it's good enough. We all move forward. And then you bridge the, de the defects at the application layer. Square Cash App will move a billion transactions a day for free on the Cash App. You don't like that? Well, then try to enlightening and then let the market slug it out. But there's a lot of, in it. here's the big idea. People should take risk with the application layer. Don't risk all the money on earth by screwing around with the base layer. Right. That's a, right. that's a, that's a beautiful way to. If Bill's going to crash his company at Abra, he can do that at his layer, but he shouldn't destroy everybody else's money. Right. So, so that's the idea behind the protocol. That's why it's I'll try to do neither. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I was going to put that. I, I'm sure you'll do neither. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Thank right. you. And I'm from Canada where we're still a mix of metric and imperial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, 
let me go to Guillermo, but before, let me just inject one thing uh, that I know, don't know the right place to put it, but uh, we'll use this uh, webinar as a, a point in time to say, we're gonna accept Bitcoin for A360 memberships. So I just wanna plug that out there. It's, it's time that we start using this as a, a medium of exchange as well. Guillermo. Thank you, Peter. Amazing session. Uh, hi, Bill. Hi, Michael. Um, two quick questions. One is about DeFi. Uh, there are, uh, we have seen like in this 50% drop, uh, DeFi projects have performed pretty good. So how are those projects that are giving 130% a year, like Pancake Swap or Cake, against other uh, staking options. So how trustable they are based on the amount of APY that they are offering, that's first question. And sure. second, which could be two stocks that could correlate with Bitcoin for people that have to do collaterals or stuff like that, that the banks are not accepting Bitcoin assets as collateral, but you have to put it, just for not to put it on a bank account, you have to put it on the stock market maybe for looking at your money performing as a as it's there as a collateral. And and Bill, when you're when you're addressing DeFi, can you take a second and just for those who don't know, give us a simple explanation if you're sure you know, I'll, I'll I'll pump Michael some more and say, hey, if you if you want exposure to Bitcoin right now, micro micro strategy stock may be your best bet. I was gonna uh, I was gonna put that, that play. <laughs> I, I don't know if Michael's allowed to say that. MSTR. So, so, so I'll say it for him, MSTR and alternatively, of course, you can buy the grayscale. Uh, the Grayscale uh, Trust, which might actually not be a bad time since I think it's still trading at a discount uh, and they have an ETF application pending. But I have no, you know, Michael and I are not involved in each other's companies directly. So so I'm OK, I think, in, in, in saying that on the stock question. On the DeFi question, decentralized finance is an attempt to use effectively what are called smart contracts to replicate uh, aspects of the traditional centralized banking system. And, and the question that uh, 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 I think Guillermo was asking was related specifically to contracts that are used to generate yield, uh, meaning you put into a contract a certain amount of an asset like Ethereum or a dollar stable coin, and you get out more than what you put in. How is that happening? Okay, so, uh, and, and the simple answer is, is the most important reason that's happening is, is that these protocols are creating their own new tokens, like Cake, like Pancake, uh, and they're actually paying you in those new tokens, which are usually, in the case of, of the bigger ones, liquid right away, so that you can change it from their you know, uh, you know, smaller agave or pancake token into something like a stable coin. So you're not going to take long-term risk in holding some other token. Okay. The challenge with DeFi, and this is why I tell people to tread very carefully, especially if you're not a technologist. Okay. Is that when you create a smart contract on these systems and you put that contract out there that promises this yield, if there's a bug in that code, okay, that bug by definition is now a feature because you can't change it. You can create a new contract, but any money that's sitting in the old contract that you can't get out, you know, could be stuck forever. So tread very carefully. And I would always only use DeFi systems in very small amounts initially, look up, you know, code audits. And if you don't know what you're doing, let us do it for you, <laughs> right? And, and, and for the vast majority of the people who are never gonna be able to read smart contract code, you're better off with, you know, Abra or one of our other competitors that will help you uh, generate that yield using DeFi, as opposed to, you know, going after what looks like too good to be true numbers, which often are. So tread very carefully with uh, with DeFi in in general. Yeah, my my take on the space is Bitcoin is just a base layer asset, and you can build applications in central and traditional banks like a JP Morgan or a Morgan Stanley, they can actually become banks in this area. They're not right now, but they're get, but they will eventually enter. You can, you'll see companies like Square and PayPal, they're getting in the business. They're another way to bank it. You'll see, uh, you, you see with Abra and you see with BlockFi and, the, and those types, you see companies that are either giving you loans or giving you yield against Bitcoin. 
all of those are, <clears throat> are part of the emergent uh, Bitcoin banking industry. It's early days. It's the first decade. And so it's very early. I mean, Genesis and NIDIG are commercial and uh, forms of uh, Bitcoin banks. On the DeFi side in the crypto world, they have constructed their own uh, surrogates or their, or their own model of banking, and they do it with decentralized systems. And and they're all competing, right? People will say the only way to generate yield is with DeFi. Well, not really. You can generate yield in CFI or DeFi. Right. Uh, you know, it just comes down to how you want to do it. If you don't own a bank and if you don't have capital, like then maybe you want to create your own bank in cyberspace and you go the crypto route. And if, you, if you're Fidelity, you could go the other route. I think the market will determine those. If, if you're investing in any of the other cryptos, you're, you're investing in a crypto venture. It's an, it's, at best, it's an investment like in a stock. At worst, it's an investment like a, like a venture capital investment. And the risk, the risk and the complexity you know, is much higher by orders of magnitude. So if you're a professional and that's what you do for a living, then maybe you should play in that space. You know, I wouldn't tell my sister or my brother if they needed a loan against Bitcoin or yield against Bitcoin to go do that. I would say go to Abra or go to BlockFi or, or, or go to some, and I, and if they're hyper conservative, I would say just own Bitcoin and wait a year and <laughs> or, or wait two years until everybody's old and proven in the space. And then at some point creep into some of the more interesting opportunities. Yeah. Everybody's got to decide their risk tolerance. Yeah, you know, I, I probably just one comment. I, I maybe take a little contrarian perspective over what you'll probably hear in the marketplace, and that is, I actually predict that you're going to see a lot of DeFi applications built on Bitcoin eventually. I think that as these layer two protocols that we've talked about, Michael mentioned Lightning. I talked about Lightning earlier. Um, become usable, you're going to start to see side chains and other projects that actually use Bitcoin for this, as opposed to Ethereum. Um, it hasn't happened yet because it's too expensive for uh, for small dollar applications, but I predict it's coming. And I think it's going to be super exciting to see some of these banking applications run directly on Bitcoin. And if I get a piggyback on that, I think there's one important point to make about uh, durability, integrity, and, and, and stability over long periods of time. The reason that Bitcoin is a stable network is because it's staked with energy capital. You need a volcano or a nuclear reactor or, or, some, or wind farm to run it. It's staked with political capital. You need a nation state or a governor or mayor to endorse it to let you run the Bitcoin mine. It's staked with technical capital. You need to buy hundreds of millions of dollars of, of hardware to run your Bitcoin miners. It's staked with energy engineering capital and human capital. You have to build these Bitcoin mining centers and it takes years to do it and they're complicated. And, and it's staked with time. It takes four years or three years to set this up and it's staked with financial capital from Wall Street, like US dollars. Bitcoin miners are raising hundreds of millions of dollars to build Bitcoin mines. So Bitcoin itself is sitting on a pyramid and underneath Bitcoin is US dollars and people capital and political capital from everywhere in the world and a lot of time. And so that's what makes Bitcoin stable. What makes lightning stable is Bitcoin stakes lightning. You know, the, the more state, the, the reason Ethereum is somewhat stable is the Ethereum network has proof of work and it took them a long time to get there. But if I create Michael Saylor coin tomorrow and then I and I stake my network with my own yo-yo coin, then I kind of I created funny money and I gave myself funny security and and it becomes a marketing exercise. So to the extent that a network is staked or is wrapped with an asset that is not part of the network. If Ethereum was staked with Bitcoin, it's more stable than Ethereum staked with Ethereum, right? And, and, and Yo-Yo coin staked with Bitcoin or Yo-Yo network, you know, Square Cash has $10 billion of Bitcoin in it, right? Which makes Square more stable. And we're, and we're all more stable if we are relying upon some other aspect of the system Bitcoin is thermodynamically sound because it takes so much energy and time to run the network, but it's politically sound because I can't sneak a Bitcoin mine underneath the, the governor of Texas's nose. 
the governor of Texas knows I got the Bitcoin mine there and the governor of Texas passes a law endorsing it. And that means I've in fact got Texas or a nation state endorsing my network. And, and so that's, that's an important mathematical concept here or conceptual concept when you're thinking about taking risk over the long term. If your time horizon is four weeks or eight weeks, you know, if you're buying Dogecoin based upon what Elon Musk is going to say on Saturday Night Live tonight, you don't really care, right? I mean, it's a very short term time horizon. But Michael, if you're looking out you. 100 years, you're thinking, I want nation states to support this. And not all of them all the time, but as long as there's a critical mass of nation states at any given time that support it, then you're stable. We're going to be going to Deborah, and then we're going to, go to John Brock, and then we're going to Abundance Digital Community for, uh, through, through NIA. So Deborah, you're next. Once so off. Yeah, yeah, I'm off, uh, off mute. So first of all, Peter, thank you for doing this. Two hours has flown by. So It really um, has, right? Has it, this it, changed yeah. the way you're thinking about, about Bitcoin? It, it feels a lot more legitimate and nuanced mm -hmm. and, and, and in some odd way. But yes, absolutely. And I see many, many potentials for investment here. Yep. Maybe not directly in Bitcoin, but in some of the platforms and functionality that's coming about. But my question is really thinking about unintended consequences or, for instance, the impact on the environment. So we know that Bitcoin every year creates 11.5 kilotons of e-waste. So with every new technology, there's a good part and there's significant you know, change that can happen here worldwide. But how do, how do you all think about the negative implications? So you know, the e-waste, what, what's happening there? And what, is there anything that can be done to mitigate that here in the early days? Yeah, I'll start. First of all, uh, Bitcoin uses less than 0.1% of all the energy in the world and, and a quarter of a point of all the wasted energy in the world. So 99.9% .9 of the energy issue is something else. And about one third of all the energy in the world is just wasted in general. So uh, if the world doesn't want to burn coal, you know, it solves the problem by just shutting down coal. In terms of efficiency, Bitcoin's the most efficient industrial application of energy the human race has ever developed. If you think about it, we're actually moving pure money on an electric network. So in terms of comparison, $1 in Bitcoin energy creates $200 in value. $1 in Google energy uh, creates $10 in value because they're just moving commodity information. $1 in the S&P 500, if you look at every single company, generates $4 in value. And $1 of energy put into American Airlines generates 40 cents in value. So if you're looking at real energy eaters, it's, the air, it's airlines. And if you want to see you know, industries that consume energy, it's planes, trains, automobiles, heating, air conditioning, in fact, I think somebody had calculated that uh, clothes dryers or, or yeah, dr clothes dryers in the United States use more energy than Bitcoin. So do Christmas tree lights. So uh, I mean, I think Elon did a say, disservice by by pulling this uh, pulling this conversation into the mainstream, right? I mean, one of the things that Tim Draper tweeted, which I love, is you know, have you ever looked at the amount of energy used by fiat money, by the legal system, by Wall Street, by all of those systems are probably orders of magnitude more wasted money than, than Bitcoin is. Yeah, I want, I, I, some other points. Bitcoin is the highest value use of energy on earth. Uh, the latest Bitcoin miners generate about 40 cents a kilowatt hour in revenue. The typical industrial comp company in the Western world would pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour in revenue. So if you have a volcano in El Salvador, you can monetize it at 40 cents a kilowatt hour. If you have a geothermal well in Iceland, or if you have a nuclear reactor in Greenland, if you have any stranded power, if you have a dam in the middle of Africa and you wanna monetize it, it's your single best hope to monetize stranded energy, to recycle wasted energy, and to catalyze renewable energy. So it's more of a solution to the problem than it is any kind of problem. And if you, uh, there's one last interesting dynamic here. Google can't put a data center in Iceland because they can't, they can't monetize all the energy and they need high bandwidth lines. 
A typical data center like AWS or Google, it needs super high bandwidth, triple redundancy. And so you would never put it a thousand miles from civilization. On the other hand, with a Bitcoin mine, you could put it a thousand miles from the nearest human being on a, on a very thin pipe. You could monetize the entire nuclear reactor or the entire volcano. <laughs> And you could generate prosperity for a country like El Salvador, or, or you could just, you want a wind farm, put it 10,000 miles from the nearest human being and let the wind blow because Bitcoin monetizes intermittent energy too. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty effect, effective technology. And in my opinion, the most efficient way to convert energy into prosperity the human race has yet come up with. So it's really sad when people criticize it for being environmentally unfriendly. I mean, the only, the only truth is it's the single most valuable use of energy on earth. So you can justify, you can, you can unmothball any energy plant, but if you choose to fire up a coal plant in Manhattan and the mayor of New York does nothing about it, it's not the Bitcoin network's fault, right? I and mean, Right. What just happened yesterday is the Chinese are clamping down and they're shutting down all the Bitcoin mines running on coal power plant in their provinces and the network's cleaning itself. So the political process naturally will shut down the dirty power and will migrate all the mining to clean renewable energy where it's politically accepted and supported. So that the problem works itself out over time if we just let the process work. Yeah. We should also mention the e-waste point that you raised, right? So e-waste is separate just from energy consumption. It's true that most, the vast majority of energy consumption for Bitcoin is via energy that was being created anyway. Uh, and uh, there's very little incremental new energy production because of Bitcoin, almost none. Um, on the e-waste side, however, every report that I've read incorrectly explains, and I've talked to the miners themselves about this, and they said they don't understand why people are, you know, they don't actually don't care because they have no incentive to care. Uh, but when I talk to them directly, they're like, we don't understand why these people writing these reports don't understand and don't ask us questions about the basic model for what happens when chips become outdated. It doesn't become e-waste. In the vast majority of cases, when you have a gaming rig, let's just talk about games, okay? If you have a gaming rig that you can no longer play a game on because the CPU or the GPU is outdated, you don't throw out the entire rig, you replace the chips, okay? This is what's happening with the super large mining facilities. They upgrade. They don't throw out all this stuff to become tons of waste. Every report I've read on this has this incorrect. And, and the, but the miners don't complain because they honestly don't care. <laughs> They're going to do it anyway. So, so the, just because somebody who has an agenda writes that a box, a metal box that's being used on Monday might get thrown out on Tuesday doesn't mean it's true. It yeah. turns out that when we dig in, we found out these things aren't getting thrown out. We should, yeah. we should probably take the other questions. Yeah, let's go to yeah. John Brock next. John. Hey, Peter, Michael, and Bill, thank you for being here. It's great to be on here. And I think you've clarified some of this for me, but I'd still like to ask the question. I mean, what stops the U.S. from either banning, creating their own coin, or even pushing this more forward? Because it almost makes them have to be fiscal responsible, and that's almost impossible for most governments. Yeah, I can, I don't know, let me just take this one first, because I've spent a lot of time writing about this issue on banning Bitcoin. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is software. Right. I mean, let's let's get into the nuances of what it is you would be banning. Bitcoin is software. The Supreme Court has talked about this over decades. Right. You know, software is effectively protected free speech in the United States. OK, that ship has sailed. Now, China is another issue, as we've talked about before. Right. The threat of going to prison when you have a network where every packet is read is a totally different story. OK, but in a market where you have a, a, a very clear delineation between what is free speech and what is not, there, there's simply no way. Now, you can regulate banks that touch the custodians, but you're never going to have a law that protects that, that prevents you from storing ones and zeros in your pocket. It's not going to happen. OK, yeah, I so would... the, the other thing on the on the on the the, the central bank currency at some point, the U.S. will issue a digital dollar 
as, as the Chinese are talking about. But that will not create in and of itself sound policy. That will just allow the government to bypass the banks to distribute currency. The ability to print more of that currency is going to remain. Nothing is going to change. It will just be easier to distribute. That's the only thing that's going to change. Yeah, I would say that uh, you know the government will print currencies, and the digital dollar is going to spread to billions and billions of people around the world. And and again, it doesn't really threaten an asset because the currency is the currency, the asset is the asset. Uh, and there's not a single politician that I've I, I can't find anybody on record. By the way, it, it's you know it's not illegal to own Bitcoin in China. Bitcoin is not banned in China. What's banned in China is the conversion of Bitcoin on the fiat exchanges. It's not even illegal to do Bitcoin mining in China. They're doing Bitcoin mining in China. They just don't want people to do Bitcoin mining on, uh, you know, on dirty coal or to steal the energy. So unregulated uh, mining and unregulated uses of the asset are banned. Otherwise, in every place in the world where people talk about bans or clampdowns, it's legal to own the asset. <laughs> And it's legal to own the asset in the U.S. And um, if you look at central banks, Jerome Powell, Christina Lagarde, the deputy governor of, um, of uh, the Bank of China, and Mark Carney, uh, the head of the Bank of England, have all stated on the record it's an asset. And, and uh, if you want to really understand where the regulatory environment is going, if you go on YouTube and you Google blockchain and money, you'll find 30 hours of lectures by Gary Gensler, who's the current head of the SEC. You can, I listen to all 30 hours, every minute of every 30 hours. 3 million people started the lectures. 30,000 people finished the lectures. Most people don't actually bother to figure out what he said. He said it all before he was put in charge of the SEC. The summary is... Bitcoin's a digital asset. It needs to be regulated for, for the benefit of the world, but, but we don't want to overregulate it such that we would eliminate you know, uh, the 21st century fintech economy from forming. And, and that seems to be the consensus here. Like the, the government doesn't seem to show any interest in wanting to shut it down. All they want to do is make sure you pay taxes on it. And you, uh, and you abide by anti-money laundering laws and know your customer laws. Before we go to our, our, our digital members, uh, one, of our, one more of our patrons, Patricia, please. After you unmute yourself. There we go. Hi, how are you? Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Michael and, and, and Bill. My, I'm in construction. So my question is, with regards to the three trillion dollars the this current administration is ab about to release into the economy some of it is going to be in infrastructure considering the the length of time these projects take and the inflation that we're facing or you know is happening what is the likelihood the government the federal government will use bitcoin or allow us to receive funds, get paid in Bitcoin. How do you see that conversation? Is it ever happening soon? I, I don't know that the U.S. government will get involved in that. I think that's a that's a free decision amongst amongst vendors and employees to decide how they'll act. I think Bitcoin is an asset, so getting paid in Bitcoin is like getting paid in shares of Apple stock. So, so I think that I, I would say if you got paid. You should convert your money into Apple stock if you like Apple, or convert your money to Bitcoin. But um, but the tax regime in the U.S. is it's a it's a taxable accounting event every time you transfer Bitcoin. So generally, I think the unit of account, the medium exchange, will be the dollar. And then I think every individual corporation, individual, make their own decision about how much Bitcoin they hold. Yeah, it's where do you, where do you hold your excess cash and what treasury and how do you do it? And it's uh, I mean, going back to the beginning of the conversation, what Michael said, you know, if we're <clears throat> if we're truly facing a, a 21 percent inflation rate, holding cash on your balance sheet, balance sheet is not a smart economic move. Yeah, right. The, 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 the concern is that if, if a project takes four years and you agree to an amount, you know, in U.S. dollars, uh, the project takes this long, material price increase, you know, that, that's the, 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 the way I, I think about it. Yeah, you get a, you get a dilemma. Yep. If, you, if you sign a long-term contract to deliver a fixed price and if the cost of your materials is going up, well, like look at lumber, right, which jumped. 
that that's that is the inefficiency of inflation inflation creates uncertainty into the future which makes it very difficult for vendors and companies to manage their operations and that is that is why wall street is advantaged over main street in wall street you just hold you've got eight people that hold 10 billion dollars in assets and the assets go up in value in main street you have 80,000 people doing lots of work and their costs are going up and they're rev and they're locked into contracts and relationships and and it, and uh, inflation wrecks havoc with main street but it benefits wall street and if you don't have lots of assets on your balance sheet then the havoc you know outweighs the benefit and it is what it is unfair but it is what it is yeah, and there's a risk you're going to take in the short term if you if you're taking if you convert to Bitcoin, right? So, as I take a, uh, Bitcoin for for A360 memberships and so forth, that's a risk I'm going to take. But it's how do you help move the mindset? Because one of the things, Michael, you said another thing that <clears throat> we're staking Bitcoin on is a uh, global mindset. It's people's uh, acceptance uh, of this. Yeah. Uh, it's a network. It's by the way, not, Bitcoin is a brand, and it's an and what is a, a lot of times people say, yeah. well, Bitcoin, what's it backed by? Well, what's Coca Cola backed by? If everybody, if you know you can walk into a million restaurants around the world, order a Coca Cola, drink it, and it won't kill you, and they'll say, and they'll smile and bring you one. That's a very powerful brand. And if you know that you know that you can accept Bitcoin or pay Bitcoin or hold Bitcoin and you know what it means, that's a powerful brand. People underestimate the power of that brand. It, it is really critical and it creates this powerful network effect. And, you know, uh, displacing Bitcoin is like displacing Coca-Cola. It's like, isn't there something better than Coca-Cola? Yeah, sure there is. What's the name? I try to go into a restaurant and order anything other than, a, you know, Coke Zero tastes better than Coca-Cola. I have failed a hundred times to order a Coke Zero in a restaurant. They're always like, you wanted a Diet Coke? It's like, it's only 10 years late and you still haven't upgraded to Coke Zero, 10 years? And the answer is, yeah, it, that's the network effect. Like, and, and, and it plays into money too, right? Agreed. All right, Nia, let's get to some of the uh, Abundance Digital members, um, please. Great. So two related questions from Lena and Rick. What other tools or supporting technologies for crypto should be on our radar for future investment, aka skating to where the puck is going? And Rick asked, what is the best online website resources for learning about and following crypto news? And what websites do you follow? Michael. Um, I, I'm not going to give you any, any investment ideas for, for crypto because I think there's a uh, a uh, 10,000 private companies and, and a thousand public companies and, and uh, it's, it's managing your own risk. And, and so I don't have any opinions there with regard to websites. Um, Hope.com is our website. We posted a lot of stuff about Bitcoin on it. And we also have on hope.com a collection of all the Bitcoin podcasts, all the Bitcoin leaders, all the Bitcoin websites that we found. And so if you just remember Bitcoin is hope and go there, it'll, it'll direct you to a bunch of other resources. And so that's, a, that's the first site. place I'd start. Bill, yeah. you have any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, we have a ton of content. So we publish videos uh, generic on how Bitcoin works how the other cryptocurrencies work, uh, how our app works. We actually link to third-party apps on occasion. Uh, so Abra.com has a ton of content. Actually, we have links to even hope uh, on our website as well. Uh, so, uh, so that's another, another, place, um, uh, another place you can go for sure. Nia, what do you have next? One moment, I was on a different screen. Um, let's see, I had one from Melanie. How will the advent of quantum computing affect Bitcoin and the security to one's private keys? Great question. Yeah, sometimes this pops up. Generally, it's just FUD uh, spread by some other crypto project that thinks they've got a different algorithm and they just want to create anxiety. Uh, I think the generic answer is technology is advancing and software techniques are advancing and the Bitcoin network is being upgraded all the time to, uh, to address uh, software threats and opportunities. 
And so in general, I'm not concerned about quantum computing as a threat. I think that the Bitcoin network is the most secure network in the world. And, um, and over time, if somebody comes up with some hacking idea, they'll probably hack a centralized app first. Like for example, Twitter got hacked and the hackers took over the president of the United States account and they could have started World War III. And they did it with something which is a billion times or a hundred billion times less powerful than quantum computing. So yeah, there'll be, there'll be security threats, but Bitcoin's by far the most secure thing we've got in the universe right now. And it's upgrading in the software and the hardware all the time. So I think- And the algorithms that Bitcoin uses are upgradable. So you know, we're probably 25 to 30 years away from uh, computing hardware that can crack um, you know, the, signature, the, digital signature, the digital signature algorithms Bitcoin uses. And at that point, uh, we will have long since upgraded those algorithms anyway, uh, just like we're under, the network is undergoing an upgrade right now to this new technology taproot. There will be others over the, in the coming decades as well. We've got 15 minutes left in the, uh, in the two and a half hours, and, and this has flown by. Um, I want to, uh, we'll take a, more questions from, uh, from digital and from the members here, if you have, just uh, raise your hand. But Michael, um, what hasn't been said? I mean, you've, you've delivered this in, in beautiful anal- uh, analogies and, and probably the clearest messaging and I think the thing I want people to get is this isn't just about the first world. It isn't just about us. It's about how do we create a more stable world, right? When we're looking at uplifting every man, woman, and child on the planet, um, there are going to be trillionaires living forever on Mars. That's great. But how do we give every man, woman, and child access to uh, an economic system as well as a health and educational system? And, and Bitcoin as an underlying layer uh, is fundamental in global security uh, and our and our futures. I mean, I just can't I can't stress that enough. If you want stability, you want people not revolting and starving in the streets. Yeah, I th- I think the things I haven't said that are probably important. One, Bitcoin is a bank in cyberspace offering a global, affordable, safe, simple savings account for everybody for billions of people that that either can't run their own hedge fund or choose not to it's just a bank in cyberspace (laughs) and it's the first it's the first engineered monetary network in the history of the human race and the significance of a monetary system is the monetary system is backhauling the energy of the economy When I give you goods or services or property, if we want the economy to work, you have to trade me back the monetary energy. And every civilization is based upon harnessing harnessing energy. And and generally, every civilization needed an effective monetary system. If I want to crash the civilization, I crash the money because the money is what allows humanity to cooperate. So for the first time in the history of the world, we have a protocol that lets 8 billion people on the planet with a mobile device or any device take personal custody of their own life force, which life force equals money, equals monetary energy, equals assets, equals life savings, right? They can take personal custody of their life energy in the form of a digital asset. And that protocol allows 100 million companies to spin up websites and applications that all trade with each other across regulatory jurisdictions, across space, and across time. And the the magic of this is it's not just moving a billion dollars, 10,000 miles. It's it's moving a billion dollars, 10,000 days away. Bitcoin is elemental to the civilization in the same way that steel or electricity or fire or aluminum is elemental to the civilization. No steel and no buildings. Every building is maxed out at six stories in the masonry world and then it goes to 100 with steel no aluminum no airplanes and and pete knows this better than anybody no fire no humanity no electricity no nothing 
And so we invented the equivalent of a crypto steel. And what it means is I can create an organization that could last a hundred years and I can power it with an asset that will last a hundred years. And, and generally humanity hasn't had a long duration power source. So, so it, when you think about it like that, like the Rockefeller Foundation had conventional assets and boards of directors to stay rich and stay effective for a hundred years or the Hughes Institute, but the average person, they can't endow something that would last a hundred years or 500 years. And Bitcoin is the first thing we ever came up with that is uh, that has the, the ability to convey monetary energy across time and space and across political jurisdiction with no energy loss. And in that way, call it a battery that doesn't leak or call it a canister of compressed air without a leak in it. And next time somebody tells you that inflation is critical, I want you to imagine someone saying, I really need a hole in your balloon, a hole in the ship or a hole in the battery or a short circuit in your... Here's the beauty. Everybody in economics thinks you need inflation and there's not a single engineering discipline or a single machine that was ever built in the history of engineering that worked with inflation. And, and so the, the application of conservation of energy to human action and human economics, that is the singularity that is the Bitcoin that is, that is going on right now. And that's, I think, why uh, Pete is interested in this and excited about it. And that's why I see it as, as the most important thing in my life. Uh, funny. Michael, one, of the reasons, beautiful. one of the reasons people don't talk, the average mainstream American consumer doesn't spend a lot of time complaining about inflation, right? The, the reality is, is 90 plus percent of dollar stored net worth is gone, right? Over the course of a lifetime. Uh, but the biggest challenge is, is that most people are dying uh, at such a young age that it doesn't manifest itself in a way that matters for the average person. But you start to integrate longevity into this conversation all of a sudden, it has a whole new meaning, right? What happens when people are living to 125 or 130 or 140? Uh, it's, it totally changes the dynamics of what inflation means, what money means, what sound money means, et cetera, et cetera. Love Bitcoin that. is immortal sovereignty, right? The, the general idea, the reason it's got a quasi-religious overtone is you're achieving immortality in cyberspace by creating something that is self-replicating like DNA. We're gonna take a couple more questions here in the last 10 minutes, uh, Nia and then Eli. A question from Greg. Uh, I co-founded Impact Scope, an MTP of bringing cryptocurrency and blockchain to carbon negativity, working with crypto exchanges, building APIs, which provide their customers with the opportunity to offset their transactions with high quality carbon offsets in real time. Do you support this type of initiative and or have other initiatives or suggestions to tackle this critical issues? For example, ways for encouraging that mining is done with renewable energy. I think mining is already the cleanest industry in the world. I think I think Bitcoin mining uses more renewable energy and more wasted energy than any other industry on earth. And I think people are only now just starting to realize it. I support anything that anybody does that they they are doing in pursuit of a better world. Uh, Eli and then uh, Jason Beckerman, if you want to ask, you have a couple of questions in the chat here. I'll invite you to ask those. Eli? Great, great. Thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, for Michael and Bill, what approaches have you found to be effective on a personal level in shifting mindset or at least encourage consideration regarding the spreading of the power of uh, Bitcoin in the effort to help and drive adoption? So your friends and family members that just kind of want to get a handle of it. I think it helps to get out of your get out of your own frame of reference. So if you go study what happened in Argentina or Venezuela or Zimbabwe, or you go to any country outside the U.S. and Africa and you study study their economic system, it, go go Google uh, Argentine currency devaluations. It will be a very long article, hmm. you know, with about twenty of them, and then just read it, and then imagine that in the U.S. and that that gives you empathy. So stretches your 
it stretches your system. I mean, engineers know that, you know, the, the gravitational constant is the same in the U and in, 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 on the earth, but on Mars it's different. And so because they know it's different in different uh, places, they have a much more open set of mathematic protocols. Sometimes we just get very myopic and we just imagine only life in our little sphere of influence. And we start to cut corners and make assumptions that we shouldn't make. We, we're also, our mindsets are, are uh, very short, right? We're only remembering what's happened in the last even weeks, months, and we, uh, we sort of glorify the past. We forget how, how challenging and difficult it was. Um, it's partly just the wiring of the human brain uh, that's local and linear in that regard. Uh, Nia, did you want to ask a question? But uh, Jason Beckerman, do you want to uh, ask first? Yeah, thank you very much, Peter, for putting this on. And um, Michael and Bill, thanks for taking the time today. A uh, huge fan, Michael. Um, so I, I've been in uh, Bitcoin since 2012. This is my third cycle and roller coaster uh, that happens every time. Um, we've talked a lot about the power of what could happen over the next you know, 50, 100 years. In your mind, from an engineering perspective, what do you think the the biggest risk factor to the Bitcoin network is over that time period? I mean, the only legitimate risk that's material, I could say, is just a black swan and unknown unknown, because if you're humble, you can't dismiss the fact there's something you don't know that might be a material threat. But I think that the most likely turbulence just comes from FUD. You know, the Chinese mine too much Bitcoin, crash. The Chinese aren't going to mine Bitcoin, crash. The FBI can't trace it crash. The FBI traced it, crash. The IRS will ban it, crash. Oh, the IRS says I can keep it, but I got to pay taxes on it, crash. Right? I mean, it's just continual, you know, anxiety due to some news because it trades 24-7, 365 on leverage. And on Twitter, someone amps up something on Sunday morning and it does something. So I think that's the most likely, you know, headache. At what asset class level do you think it, the volatility starts to taper off to the point where it doesn't, you know, swing the way that it has over the last three cycles? Ten trillion, maybe. Yeah. Bill, do you agree with that? Um, on the volatility question, probably, um, probably, I would have, I would have said probably twenty-five, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, at that point, I mean, it's 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 certainly going to asymptotically, you know, approach some other number as we grow. Um, but yeah, somewhere in that range. And, well, Bitcoin, and I think, yeah. Sorry, Bitcoins would say Bitcoin is truth and, and the, it's giving you true price discovery. And it's the price discovery 27,365 everywhere on Earth. And so sort of by definition, the prices are going to be a little bit more volatile or a lot more volatile because there's there's freedom. And there's transparency and there's truth. The freedom being somebody wants to bet 2,000 to one leverage on Saturday morning for a minute, they have the freedom to do it, right? Yeah. So that freedom plus that truth makes it a little bit more volatile. But I think that it, it's clear that it's less volatile today than it was three years ago. And I think that every single time it, it grows by a factor of two, three, four, it'll get less volatile. And once it gets 10 to 20 trillion, it, it'll still move. Yeah. Volatility is the price we pay for winning. Right. right? It, it, say, it, Tom Brady, the lines. LeBron the James, front. they're the most volatile players, right? Yeah. The winners are volatile. Yeah. On the, on the risk issue though, I, I, you know, Michael and I have talked about this. I, I, we may disagree a little bit on this, but I think, I think there, one thing I would like to see a protocol upgrade on in the next five years. Uh, and that's how long we have to think when you have a, a non-centralized governance structure is this issue of privacy and fungibility. And I think this is a, it's not a systemic risk, um, but I think it's a limiting factor that I would just like to see go away. Um, and that governments would have no say in this idea of whitelisted addresses and blacklisted addresses and all this other bullshit. And the easiest way to deal with that is just address the fungibility issue, do a series of network upgrades over the next 10 years and slowly, right? And, and the issue will go away. Bitcoin will work just fine without it, but in my opinion, it will work a little bit better with it. And that's, it's not a, a, a systemic risk, but it gives governments fodder to meddle in something that they don't totally understand. And if you remove the opportunity for meddling, the network is going to be, uh, you know, even more usable uh, at the end of the day. I'm going to uh, 
end our conversation on this question from Jason English, who uh, asks, uh, how can we as bullish supporters of Bitcoin help use our companies to promote the Bitcoin story? And Michael, you've done that. Uh, others have. Uh, I'm going to be doing that. Um, but can you, can you address that, uh, both of you? Yeah, well, my answer is every company on earth can do one simple thing, which is put Bitcoin on their balance sheet, right? Adopt Bitcoin as a treasury asset, either 10%, 20%, 50%, 100%, some amount as a treasury asset. That's easy. One person can do it in a matter of a day. A more complicated thing you can do is some companies can build Bitcoin into their product or their service, like Square, like PayPal, like Fidelity, like Grayscale. If you're an insurance company, a bank, a fund company, a tech company, a device company, you may be able to build it, the protocol into your service or product. If so, that could be good for you. Square sold three and a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin last quarter, right? It could be good, but I think that comes down to what your PNL is. And so those are the, that's my quick answer to that. I'll just make one plug for, for Bill and Abra here. I've gone to my service, people who provide me services and I say, open an Abra account and I'll pay you in Bitcoin, right? It just in terms of getting that kind of mindset going. Bill, you want to add something here? Yeah. I mean, look, we're onboarding institutional customers every day now. Companies are coming to us, mid-sized companies are coming to us and saying, hey, um, we, we, we love your dollar high yield product, but we would also like to start to put a small amount of our long-term holdings into crypto, uh, you know, Bitcoin or a little bit of Ethereum. And can you explain to us what the risks are? How does it work? Um, should we dollar cost average as a company or should we go all in? And so, you know, we'll spend time with people to explain our perspective on doing that. But that's by far the best thing that companies can do today uh, to support the ecosystem. It's it's I mean, accepting Bitcoin as payment is fine. Uh, you know, I think the way Elon did it, I probably wouldn't have done it um, <laughs> at that scale. But but the more important thing that you can do when you're dealing with the digital gold narrative is to accept it as digital gold and use it as digital gold, which is long term holdings. Yeah. So, uh, Michael, Bill, uh, thank you, guys. Thank you for your time, for your generosity. Uh, Michael, uh, you've got one of the clearest, uh, strongest messages around Bitcoin is abundance in the world. Uh, and it's a message I'm super excited for us to be sharing here today. Bill, thank you for your work um, to give it up for Michael and Bill. Thanks for having us, Peter. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. so much. Great to see you and guys. Thanks, everybody, for indulging us for this last few hours. Uh, it's awesome. Awesome. All right. <laughs> thank you all. It's been awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for hosting. Thank you.